How are you listening to someone? Or you, you volunteer yourself? No, no, to the platform. No, it's like that. Hmm? That's the proceeding. Is like that. Out, do they have a mic? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the session at uh, uh, the under the management of the Obama Constitutional Review Workshop on today, on the 14th of November, or so September 2021. My name is Manamit Shoke, I'm the executive director of the Obama Council of NGOs. I uh, will be uh, taking you through the initial part of this session, uh, and then later on, I'll help on to uh, Mr. Donald Zeberani uh, to continue the video proceedings. Uh, so I can come with everything we do here. Don't have a but uh, allow me to just take this mask off. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, today it's an honor to be standing in front of you. Uh, to be treating our constitution as a country. We do believe as civil society that it is our responsibility as Botswana to take the lead. And in some instances, as is the case today, be the ones that lead in our institutions into the Botswana we want. Uh, it is our interest as Congo to ensure that each and every Botswana, by any means necessary, is allowed to participate in this process. And we will be looking out to both civil society in the leadership of this country to facilitate Botswana to participate in this uh, activity. As you might recall, this, uh, this, this was initiated, uh, the, the, the country has been calling for a constitutional review of the citizen for a bunch of times. However, uh, recently, <coughs> during his uh, campaign, uh, the president announced that he intends to carry Botswana into uh, in, into the 2024 elections with the new constitution. And we have also uh, acknowledged the fact that we also did meet with uh, Minister, Minister of Finance, Presidential Affairs, Governance, and Public Administration, who also reiterated that statement. And we are joined today by uh, assistant, uh, Honorable Assistant Minister of the same ministry uh, of Presidential Affairs, Governance, and Public Administration, uh, Honorable Timothy Nishak. Uh, who will be standing in for Remo Ryan, who is supposed to be here. I want also to take this opportunity before introductions uh, of the special people to recognize uh, the people that we have in this discussion. I would like to recognize first and foremost, uh, and also to note before that, that we, have, we have anticipated the former vice president, uh, his honor, uh, Dr. Bonatti Wikile. But this morning, uh, due to circumstance again, his control, he could not join us uh, because of our family matters that is that he had confirmed as uh, of yesterday. But this morning, it's changed. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity now to recognize the presence among us of our uh, uh, Honorable uh, Dimizin Bishak as the Assistant Minister of Presidential Affairs, Governance, and Public Administration. I also want to take this opportunity to recognize among us uh, uh, Mr. David Mahal, who's joined us today as a former minister and also the, 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 the head of the BDP political party, uh, better. Also amongst us, I would like to recognize the presence of uh, Dr. Michael Dinake. Uh, who is the former leader of opposition and also a veteran MP and uh, who's joining us here, uh, again, 
Thank you very much for joining us. I also want to take this opportunity to uh, recognize the presence of uh, Dr. Jeffrey Ramsey, or Jeff Ramsey. And Jeffrey is one of the common. <laughs> and, uh, Dr. Jeff Ramsey, let me say the one that I'm comfortable with, who's uh, a former government employee. Uh, he was at some point the press secretary to the president. He's been holding various uh, info, you know, government positions, and people have uh, various positions, and he's also been in the media department. Also, we are anticipating that the presence of Dr. Kai Ramonipe, uh, who will be presenting the government. We are also anticipating the presence of, of no, we also want to recognize uh, one of the panelists, uh, Professor Bonamundi Kupina, who is joining us from the University of Toronto. Uh, we also want to recognize among us the persons of uh, men, oh, sorry, the, 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 the head of uh, our the chairperson of, of, of the Zona Council of NGOs, Reo Nibide Machete, gave him the Spidog of Congo. And we also want to, he's also joined by members of Congo board, uh, both virtually and uh, physically. Physically, here we have uh, the treasurer and the head of uh, governance uh, in the government committee group, named Mr. Tom Marabelli. I think she just stepped out, uh, who's also the executive director of the Center for Public Integrity. Marabelli is entering the Also, amongst the us, we have a main charity, Iki. Uh, as a board member and also the chairman of the donors mental health member. Also a board member at the home. I also recognize uh, the presence of the Republic of Party, uh, who is uh, also a board member and uh, and, uh, and uh, also the, 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 the director of Jana Watch. I also want to take this opportunity uh, to recognize, and I'll join our colleagues online, I'll, I'll come to, to, to that part. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity to see how to recognize among us our esteemed guests from the media, uh, led uh, today by our moderator, who are being selflessly also, uh, Boris Garani and others in the rest of the media. Also among us as a group, here we have our, some of our esteemed and leaders and veterans of civil society who are still energetic. I will be making a huge mistake, Alice Mokwe, who has been a pioneer of human rights. Some of us go to the space because of her resilience, some of her widespread growing up. Some of us space. Let me just talk to the uh, online. Uh, we also have uh, the signatories from uh, the attorney generals. Uh, I, 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 I'm not aware that we have the attorney general here amongst us online, and uh, there are many other different directors from the government. Uh, we recognize your presence. And I want to also recognize members from different uh, segments of civil society, uh, from, from government, of course, from private sector, and, and in the China in general, who are joining us today. I want to welcome you. Uh, they are saying audio is not good, our voice is okay, because I'm moving a little bit more. Let me see if the uh, administration that it can help. Yes, I, I also want to, to recognize all of you here. I also want to take this opportunity to recognize the presence of our partners, uh, Saia, uh, led by uh, Steve and, uh, and your team. I also want to recognize uh, you know, Saia, for those who don't know, is South African Institute of International Affairs, our partner in this, in this journey. I also want to recognize the presence of our friends from International Idea. Uh, international idea, Jonathan is, is a member of the International Ideas Council. And we are here today. We've done numerous work on 
And also to recognize the presence of various speakers and moderators uh, that are going to be part of us today. I, in the interest of time, I want to just recognize that all the speakers are online and all the individuals join us. Let me say that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to uh, call upon my to come and uh, okay. uh, Welcome once. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Namit. Let me take this opportunity. To recognize the presence of Assistant Minister in the Ministry of Residential Affairs, Governance, and Public Administration, Tim Kuhn. Let me take this opportunity further to recognize the presence of former Cabinet Minister, Ray David Mara, who is joining us virtually. Let me recognize the presence of the former leader of opposition in parliament, uh, Michael Dineke, we appreciate you, sir, who is joining us physically. Let me recognize the presence of Dr. Jeff Ramsey, former president of the country and president. Um, recognize members of the board of Congo who are here present, those that are joining us online. Um, Rev. Professor Inoko Pila, um, Justice John Venn, and Ms. Pilsen, uh, former judge of the Constitutional Court of South Africa, Mayor Pilsen Tomara Pei, who is a board member, but also a panelist on the day today. Uh, I, I also want to recognize our partners from SAIA and from IDEA International, uh, Mem Mamo Web, pioneer and leader in the issue of human rights in this republic. We recognize you and appreciate your being here today. Members from India, uh, all stakeholders that are joining us virtually and physically. We recognize your presence and appreciate your being here this morning. I want to start by laying uh, context to the civil society movement in Congo, what it means for us to be engaging in this kind of conversation on this day. Our contribution as civil society over the years, country development, no doubt about it, we left a foot in terms of what we have been able to contribute towards the development of this department. We do this um, at different levels, especially the provision of services level, which basically speaks to providing services to some of the most marginalized in our society. Whether you talk about local living with disabilities, men and children, the youth, economically disadvantaged, and so on and so forth. But we also, on the other hand, focus on issues of advocacy, as it relates to human rights, as it relates to good governance, and as it relates to um, uh, legislative and policy reviews as may be necessary. Now, we, we do have a um, the right mid term civil society to provide the kind of uh, discussion, the kind of discussion that we're having today, because we're drawn from experience on the people that whose legislative framework um, directly affects. We appreciate fully how this affects them, how the development um, of the country directly affects them. 
in their different capacities. We also want to take the opportunity to highlight the where expectations from us as civil society keepers, depending on the we are recording in progress. The very next day, to this center that was celebrated.
is a long time that we consider first and foremost ratification of the international convention. Let us start in court to see if that's a very diffuse, those principles can then be diffused into our constitution. It's not a time that the constitution does provide for us to guarantee that we're saving in political life. But there are also certain forms, but even in some instances, the constitution guarantees the money and takes with that. Such that they can allow a subsidiary head of parasite. So actually, it's limited to the rate of level at which one gets to know the right is that the But those that have been some of the posts that are shared by some members of the subset society. We said, what happens when the society now in the CS conversation around social economic life for this country? In addition to that, issues such as Access to land. We all know that in this public access to land is a big issue. But at the same time, the access to land will give you a chance of land that is not good to provide you. Can we have the constitution, for example, addressing such issue to facilitate the enjoyment of opportunities in aspects such as access to land, especially given the challenges of jobs that we why do I still make uh, uh, issues such as right to power? Can you continue comfortably having provisional access as a period? Or is it time that we now start considering to have access to power with the right to all citizens in the trial? But as we also included, there is also an issue which is very key that deals with governance. Is that, 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 that speaks to uh, to the extent to which our constitution facilitates issues such as separation of powers. It's very clear as it organized the way out of government, but to what extent does the constitution actually go on to ensure the independence that the notion of separation of powers actually seeks to We need to be reflected on. Um, I was having a conversation with somebody who said, you know, when you look at, for example, the appointment of that, the prerogative of the case, but the JSC, which has an explanation, comprises of presidential appointees. So, by extension, the day appointment of that is the entire prerogative of the information. When you go to the IEC, is appointed by judicial information. And the second time of the IEC is appointed by the executive. But it means when you get the intricate relationship between the executive and the judiciary, is a subject that you need to engage on. As a part of the people say, is this the kind of relationship, the kind of thing that we envision for that doesn't serve our a new independence between our house of government. Very essential. The last issue that we'd like for us as we engage, and I would like to challenge our students to touch on the engagement, was on the issue of accountability and oversight. Does Parliament or Parliament of Council have the necessary capacity, the necessary power that they have? To so play that obligation role of oversight. We could see this a lot where the parliament is very important in holding the executive council due to our manner of certain institutions such as the constitution. But we have sufficient safeguards to assure us um, as a public uh, in terms of oversight. It's important for us from our civil society to engage in this process. We can get most of the accountability, issues of separation of powers, human rights, uh, and so on and so forth. As I close, we reiterate the commitment for us to continue working with governments as we've always done in the beginning 
Um, Assistant Minister, you are muted. Uh, I will be muted right now from the start. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but there's a kind of echo um, on your audio at the moment, so participants are struggling to hear you. Um, are you able to take it from the beginning again, please? Uh, I apologize. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, this this distinguished first uh, speakers, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the media. I've skipped um, 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 acknowledging. Is one of the former vice president, Dr. 
Honourable Minister Dumezwini. Hi, I apologise for interrupting you again. It seems like the issue is still persisting and uh, our participants are really battling to hear. Um, let's, let's see if that... No, it's still there. It's a very strange okay. echo. No, it hasn't improved. I apologize for interrupting you for a second time. Maybe the minister could log off quickly and log on again. That that may help or, or adjust his audio settings. We can try that. Thanks, Steve. Apologies to all of our participants. Um, we're just having a few technical difficulties, but we should have it resolved soon. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, how's my line? Am I clear? Yes, my pillow, you are clear. Very clear. Yeah, very clear. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hello. 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 Um, we can Hello? hear your voice a bit better now, Minister. Can we just? You can, uh, you can hear me now. Yes, that's much better. Um, that's if much you better. wouldn't mind, <laughs> just uh, running us through uh, your presentation again from the start. I I sincerely apologize, okay. but it is not better now. Not, not a problem. Can I start now? Yes, that, go that, ahead. Yes, um, I believe Dr. Gidiklo is not present. The former vice president is honored the former vice president. That's what I heard earlier. Uh, pardon? Who is not present? Uh, the former vice president, um, Dr. Pierre Kidikim. I cannot confirm that at the moment. Okay. Not, not a yes. That's one of our Bakonga colleagues again. Yes, uh, sorry. No, he's not here. Thank you very much. 
Okay, can I proceed now? The director of ceremony, can I proceed? Yeah. Director of ceremonies, um, distinguished speakers, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the media. I'm very honored to join you all in this workshop whose discussions are centered around the expected constitutional review, which the government remains committed to. I'm particularly delighted that civil society has found it worthwhile to start some discussions while awaiting the actual constitutional review process to commence. Well done and keep it up. Program director, I've been, I've been informed that the workshop is held under the theme towards a people-driven constitution. The theme is undoubtedly well thought, as we in government are also of the belief that any outcomes of the constitutional review must be people-centered. Such can only be achieved if, if consultations are thorough and people have an opportunity to join to input an, an opportunity to input on any on what they envisage. In that regard, this workshop has helps build the case and evidence of consultation. Bahaid, like in any other country in the world, national leaders are very influential in setting the tone for public discourse. It is therefore not surprising that. After President Mukwege Masi's repeated expressions of a desire for a constitutional review, as well as pronouncement of the same in the BDP manifesto of the 2019 general elections, there is so much expectation among Botswana. We are pleased that we have caught the attention of so many of our countrymen and women, and we wish to assure you all that our commitment is as steadfast as ever. At the appropriate time, the process of consultations on the review of the constitution will commence. Program director, one thing that we must all be mindful of, however, is that the constitution is a sensitive document and should therefore be reviewed with utmost caution and sober minds. I'm certain that nobody in Botswana wishes to wishes for this envisaged process to be a case, cause of untenable divisions amongst us. Thus far, we have been a united and proud nation. We have been, uh, and we must maintain the status quo. So once the process commences, this attitude must inform us every step of the way. Distinguished guests, during the 2020 State of the Nation address, His Excellency the President reiterated the government's commitment to the promised constitutional review. He also went further and informed that it will commence as soon as practically possible, and even cautioned that the process is sensitive and ought to be handled with care. These sentiments cannot be taken lightly now and they should not be taken even lightly once the process kick starts. We must all aspire to come out of the process just as united, if not more united than before. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish now to conclude my welcome Marks by reminding you all that our forefathers created and left us a constitution that has kept Botswana at peace from the time we attained our independence. A lot of wisdom went into the creation of the foundations of our nation. This is the same heritage that we must aspire to leave for our children. In future, when our children sing Kibu Swa Travel Rage, they must do so with pride, knowing very well that we too left them a heritage to be proud of. Let us do and consider only that which is necessary and not be tempted to propose or make changes just for the sake of being seen to be doing something different. With 
these remarks. It is my singular honor to declare this workshop officially open. May God bless Botswana. Apula Ene. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, uh, that I you are here really uh, uh, working of the government in terms of this process. And we are uh, we 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 take uh speak very seriously and that's what we have to say uh from the regulations to the civil society. We do believe that our uh, civil society is being educated but our responsibility to ensure that uh, we are to be aligned to the to the ethos of this country and that's why and as such, uh, we still be looking forward to ensuring that we understand the sensitivity in that comes with the constitutional process and the level of constitutional data. Honorable Minister, you are allowed uh, to pay votes uh, so that we can also be able to interact with uh, the other honorables at that time in this house, and maybe they can uh, interact with you at that point. Uh, because in the next session, uh, I'm going to be calling uh, upon. Yes, I'm going to be calling uh, my co-moderator, who will be now running the next part of the session, uh, General Patricia Severani. Uh, General Patricia Severani is a humanitarian pension manager. Uh, he's also the host of the kind political child radio show, Don 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 Pike, which he was presented from 19. From the seven o'clock to eight o'clock, I've been part of that show. Uh, Donald has interviewed President, Chief Justice of the Donna, Cabinet Ministers, current and past speakers of the National Assembly. This show is about to roll out a program that will indicate the Donna on issues of the position of the party. Uh, Let's say that allow me to call Alas uh, Ganani and uh, also to invite you to this show as a sensible we are just doing some repositioning um, to enable the audio to improve. Um, please just be patient while we figure this out. A very good morning, um, and let me thank Rasokwe uh, for those kind uh, words and introduction. Um, it is imperative for us to start this conversation of constitutional review and constitutional conversation. And let me thank the Botswana Council of Non-Governmental Organizations and the Southern, South African Institute of International Affairs for putting this together and all the guests of honor and uh, speakers for this particular session that I'm hosting until around lunchtime. I would say our protocol observed and uh, kickstart the program having worked um, Having worked for, for radio for um, almost half of my life, I respect time very, very much. We are almost 30 minutes late. So we'll try and keep everything moving as quick as possible. And thanks a lot for being patient as we sort out the issues. My task this morning is really to facilitate um, a topic, a comprehensive and not a piecemeal review, voices from the ground. What are some of the key greatest takeaways you can highlight from the current constitution of the Republic of Botswana, why constitutional review and why now? What are the shortcomings in the current, of the current constitution? What is envisioned, envisioned for the updated constitution? Those are amongst the questions that we will try and answer this particular morning. And uh, to speak to this um, before we bring in um, uh, uh, from Bokongo. I would like to invite um, to get an input from 
a former government spokesperson. I've dealt with him from my years at uh, Gabs FM up until he left when I was while I must be my firm. Um, I consider him a person of great knowledge in the constitution and obviously the history of the Republic of Botswana based on his articles that he has written. Uh, former uh, Deputy Permanent Secretary for Government Communication under the Office of the President, Dr. Jeff Ramsey. The stage is yours, sir. Thank you. And please, uh, let's keep our, 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 our gadgets mute um, all across. And if you can, please switch off your cameras in the meantime, uh, so as we can try and save as much bandwidth and don't get into technical issues. So Dr. Ramsey, the time is yours, sir. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, I will not go through all the protocol, but I will acknowledge the presence of the Assistant Minister of Presidential Affairs, Governance and Public Administration. And also I want to especially acknowledge two of our great statesmen, the Honorable Michael Denaki and Honorable David Mahang. And with that, I will we'll say all protocol observed. It is an honor and a privilege for me to join all of you in taking part in this very important exercise this morning. While I believe our country's current constitution as amended over the years has on balance served us well in the past, I am of the view that this constitutional review is a welcome and overdue initiative. There is a counter argument that stable democracies are more often rooted in stable constitutional frameworks that may be best evolved through incremental amendments such as already such is as already provided in our current document. For better or worse, the Americans have since 1789 been governed by a constitution that through a combination of 27 amendments and a continuous process of judicial interpretation uh, has evolved into a document that better addresses the governance demands of a society that is very different than that of the late 18th century when the original document was drawn up. In the process, once radical changes such as the guarantee of equal rights under the law, the introduction of nearly universal suffrage and the abolition of safe slavery have become the law of that particular land. The justification for reviewing our own constitution, a document rooted in 1963 Lobatsi Conference and modified by our 1966 transformation into a sovereign republic and subsequent amendments is I would submit not found in its vintage. Neither is it necessitated by the circumstances behind its inception, the history of its drafting otherwise being a debate perhaps better left to future four. It is a debate, but maybe we should move forward here. What has become compelling in recent decades is the popular outcry that suggests that we have reached a stage where there is an urgent need to confront a host of long-standing and unresolved governance issues, such as, but not limited to, the balance of powers between the executive and legislative branches of government, the independence of our oversight institutions, potential alternatives to the current first past the post electoral system, the proper role of local and traditional authorities within a unitary republic, a contemporary understanding of the citizenry's fundamental rights and legitimate expectations, and I would suggest the influence of foreign money and interests in our local politics. If there is one lesson that history, both domestic and international, can teach us, it is that there has never been such a thing as a perfect constitution. Constitutions that have worked best have been those that are attuned to popular expectations, while also serving to check the abuses that inevitably arise from unbridled concentrations of power. The Soviet Union's 1936 constitution was notable for its robust guarantees of democracy and extensive catalog of human rights, including third generation rights. Yet its launch coincided with consolidation of Stalin's rule of terror. De jure freedoms on paper count for little in the context of a de facto totalitarian police state. In other words, shamocracy is not a new thing. It's the content in action that counts. A better example of good intentions gone bad is the post-World War German constitution, 
In his classic study, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, William Shearer described the 1919 Weimar Constitution as, and I quote, on paper, the most liberal and democratic document of its kind in the 20th century. Full of ingenious and admirable devices which seem to guarantee the working of an almost flawless democracy. Yet ultimately the same document was manipulated by the Nazis to establish and consolidate the most odious tyranny in human history. What went wrong? Many have pointed a finger at the Constitution's Enabling Act, a provision that allowed the executive with the consent of the legislature to assume sweeping state of emergency powers. While in 1923, the said provision had enabled Gustav Stressman to take extraordinary measures needed to pull Germany back from the brink, arising from hyperinflation and political turmoil. A decade later, it opened the door to Hitler's genocidal dictatorship. Arguably another feature of the Weimar Constitution that facilitated the rise of the Third Reich was what at the time was considered to be one of its most progressive features and indeed most enduring legacies, its provision of proportional representation. Ideally, proportional representation ensures a fair distribution of seats based on political party vote. Variations of PR voting systems around the world have led to more inclusive governments. In this respect, there are many models which can be explored of what has worked and not worked in jurisdictions around the world. A potential downside which has characterized the, oper the operation of PR in 1920s Germany and elsewhere is its incentivizing of the fracturing of broad-based political parties into independent factions, often based on personal ambitions rather than collective values. Such disintegration can open the door to the rise to power of better disciplines, even authoritarian minority movements, such as was the case of the Nazis. In this context, even where democracy survives, systems of proportional representation can contribute to factional gridlock. I say can, doesn't have to. The modern state of Israel is an example. Before 1992, political party, a political party needed a threshold of only 1% of the vote to enter their parliament, the Knesset. Subsequent raising of the threshold to 3.25% has since largely failed to stem the proliferation of political parties in Israel, leading to unstable coalitions. Over the past two years, this has resulted in the country having held four national elections. Turbulent government coalitions have arguably impacted the wider international community as well as the Israeli public. Over the years, moderate Israeli politicians have been hampered in their ability to negotiate concessions that could have led to broader regional accommodation, for example. If Israel is an example of the potential pitfalls of a low threshold PR or proportional representation, recent Turkish history provides a counterexample of the distorting effects of higher thresholds. There, the ruling Justice and Development Party first came to power in 2002 by winning two thirds of the seats in parliament with only 34% of the vote in a proportional representation constitution. This was because the breakup of the previous coalition government had resulted in all but one of the competing parties having failed to gain the minimum 10% of the vote needed to enter parliament. With their initial supermajority, the AKP, that is the ruling party in Turkey, has since been able to tighten its grip on power. Other issues may be considered in framing an alternative electoral system based in whole or part on proportional representation. These include the inherent value of having representatives accountable to a given constituency rather than the whims of political bosses drawing up party lists. My view is that constituency service has over the years been a positive factor in promoting more equitable development through grassroots political engagement, especially in our rural areas, and should thus be retained in some form. In addition, various models of PR consideration may be given, in, in addition to various models of PR, consideration may also be given to two round election systems in which uh, anyone can, in which whenever a candidate fails to get a majority, 
uh, the top two face a runoff election. Neither the 1963 Constitution nor its stopgap LegCo predecessor was the first effort to create a national constitution in our country. This honor goes to the ultimately abandoned 1871, 1871 Constitution of the United Baralong Batlaping and Bangwatetsi Nations, which was to also included the Bakwena. A truth, this is a truly extraordinary, complex, and sadly neglected document. It does exist on paper, and is, I think, worth looking at. In 1920, Isang Pilani proposed a constitutional framework for the Bichuana Land Protectorate at the first setting of the then Native Advisory Council. While in 1952, Sekedi Kama found support among his peers in the same council for his proposal for a federated African authority. Do any of these historical footnotes have any insights you might ask for us today? Each of the above actually directly address questions of ongoing relevance, such as how to forge a United Nation out of diverse traditional polities or marathon, how to accommodate popular sovereignty with traditional authority. And in this context, all three of the initiatives I mentioned, historical initiatives provided for houses of chiefs or employee de Corsi. How to integrate indigenous and ported legal concepts and how to reconcile local authority with centralized governance. So these issues are not new. Including, let me note that perhaps the most salient question to be addressed in our constitutional review is whether the time has come to replace our Westminster style parliamentary system based as it is on the fusion of executive and legislative authority with a presidential system in which there is a true separation of power between the executive and legislative branches of government. Such consideration will inevitably issues such as the potential direct election of the president, the appointment of cabinet members from outside parliament, and the enhancement of parliament's oversight role in checking mismanagement and or abuses on the part of the executive branch and or the public service. From my own years within the office of the president, I can affirm that our presidents have had to be mindful of the potential for backbench or cabinet revolve. So they have not been free handed. While this has to some extent provided a healthy check on potential executive out overreach, it has also encouraged the development of the current situation, in which cabinet has swollen to a point where its numbers may exceed the ruling party's backbench. Back in 1966, there was a conscious decision on the part of our constitution's framers to create a strong government centered on an executive who combined the functions of head of state and head of government to drive the nation's development planning and delivery. So I'm saying here, it isn't an accident. There was a, a deliberate decision to create a very strong executive at that time. Today, we may ask if retention of our current parliamentary setup is not giving us both a weakened executive and a weakened legislature. We have on the one hand, an executive who is unable to draw from the talent outside of parliament to drive his or her agenda. And on the other hand, a parliament whose ties to the executive prevent it from effectively discharging its independent oversight and legislative functions. Finally, I think, and I'm, I'm drawing a bit from uh, Ray Machete, that any constitution, if it's going to be driven by the people, the people have to know what the constitution is. It disturbs me that in our education system, it seems that civics has been neglected. I know I grew up in a different society when I was a child that we were very much taught not only the constitution of that country, but indeed even other countries as comparison. Whereas I've often encountered people who talk about the constitution and have never frankly read it. So I think it is quite important in terms of citizenship training that our children, our young adults, we ourselves <laughs> as adults 
be familiar with the Constitution. Why, what is its powers? Uh, what is its, and, and as well as how it can compare to alternative documents, alternative constitutional frameworks. With those few remarks, let me hear close and once more say how much I welcome this initiative. That's just something to get the ball, proverbial ball rolling. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ramzi. Um, Assistant Minister Ntimkulu, and yourselves, you have used this and cautionary line of how do you forge a United Nation based on the constitutional review? Um, because obviously there will be different ideologies, different beliefs, different thoughts in terms of what it is that has to be included in the constitution. And those are, I guess, coming from the people. How do we get there is the question. I have heard many times, um, just the last, Cut in short that you just said. And on my show, I've asked this question, what is the first section of the Botswana constitution? Oh, it was a fun show because nobody knew, really. I gave it 15 minutes for people to Google, at least, that we are, it's a sovereign nation of the Republic of Botswana. So in that context, it's very important. But the question again here for our participants to ask is, Whose responsibility is it? Is it us in the media to teach Botswana about the constitution? Is it the government? Is it those represented here being NGOs? Where do we go? And how far can we go? I'd like to call upon um, joining us virtually. He is a lawyer by profession. Surely from what I understand, his law firm was the first in the Republic. Um, he's a former cabinet minister, member of parliament for Quening East, or better known as Lim from 1979 to 2002. He's an author. I'd like to call upon Re David Mahang to give us his insight from the civil society. Those who I just talked about right now is joining us virtually. Re Mahang, if you have connected, sir, um, let me give you the platform. Um, I'm connected if the technology will allow, because we spend a lot of time not knowing what is going on. You are very audible, sir. Uh, I hope if they can switch your video on, it would be nice to see you. It is on. Uh, my video is on. I think you'll be able to see me in due course. Fantastic. Thank you. The time is yours. We can hear you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be with you this morning. It's a picture I can't see most of you, but uh, uh, the technology to uh, let us down early, early on. But I'm glad that we are talking about the topic of constitutional review that um, even the government and the ruling party themselves in their manifesto have accepted the importance of this constitutional review. So we are not talking about a topic that we intend to impose on government or on the people themselves. In fact, it has been accepted and everybody's waiting for government to, to start the ball rolling. Uh, I suppose if it were not for the intervention of the COVID-19, this constitutional review commission would have been set up by now. So uh, I'm quite happy that uh, we are talking on this constitutional review uh, when government too is obligated by its own undertaking at the elections that there would be such. But let me say right at the beginning, uh, because uh, Jeff Ramsey has clearly shown the historical uh, basis of 
our nation, so to speak, um, since independence, we have been, uh, we have done well, I could say, as a country. We have done well as a country in the sense that the constitution that we have, notwithstanding public reservation there and there, particularly from the opposition parties, uh, the fact is that we have been able to do well with our present constitution. Apart from that, as a constitution, it's a living document. It has to be reviewed from time to time and amended from time to time. Indeed, that's what was done in this country. For instance, uh, if I may give an example, the electoral commission, for instance, used to be uh, run from the president's office by the permanent secretary to the president until we came to the conclusion that we have to set up an independent electoral commission. And this is what is operating and take it out of office of the president. Of course, there are still reservation that the appointments of these commissions are done by the president. But this, these are matters that have to be put forward during the uh, commission. We have a situation where uh, we have uh, oversight institutions, which in the view of many, uh, particularly the the, the people who are concerned with the slow pace for review of the constitution comprehensively. We have institutions which are in fact still under office of the president. Uh, institutions which ought to be oversight institutions such as the ombudsman, the DCEC and securities and so forth, are all crowded in the office of the president. And the feeling is that when there is constitutional review, these oversight institutions must be separated from office of the president. Uh, we have par parliament itself. Although under the constitution, we have to have separation of power. The fact is that parliament is still administered under office of the president. And I know that the previous speakers, uh, including the, the Madam Speaker, uh, Nasha, uh, complained and wanted the amendment to be, to be done to take out the parliamentary administration from office of the president. These are some of the things which are which are to be looked at. But <clears throat> all in all, we should also accept that this constitution having saved us, it is up to us as a, as a nation to amend it according to our, our, our wishes. For instance, whether as a constitution, we should adopt the American type of constitution. For instance, that is up to us. Um, but generally, up to this stage at least, we have come to be regarded as one of the few African longest democratic system in fact, uh, statistically, in the more Ibrahim um, uh, index of African governances, we are at last as number two after Mauritius, meaning that we operate as a democracy uh, compared to most African countries there is a certain amount of re 
accountability, even that is not enough, of course, but it is there. There is political stability in the country uh, and the, save for recent years, there is uh, a government effectiveness in implementation of the policies that are put forward in order to promote the welfare of, of the people. But that is not to say that um, the constitution should be allowed to continue as it is. But as a, a democratic system, which adheres to the rule of law, it is important that when the time comes, as it has come now, we should uh, review comprehensively the constitution of the country. Uh, for instance, there has been complaints that the we could adopt, it, for instance, the uh, the presidential uh, Republican constitution, where the president is elected directly by the voters rather than indirectly by members of parliament. This is important in the sense that the people will participate effectively in electing the president that they, they, they need, that they require. At the, at the moment, the president is indirectly elected by parliament. And, and as a result, the appeal to the nation in the election, you, you appeal as a, as a party, not necessarily uh, as a, a system which will allow independent thinking from the various people. Uh, a parliamentary candidate does not necessarily, for instance, uh, a, is in favor uh, or is against the particular uh, president. Uh, we, we want to, people want to consider, for instance, that our president, for instance, the presidential powers, which were, was deliberately done. Our president, for instance, in this country, in terms of the constitution, combines the powers of the control of the executive, as well as being the, having the executive power. In, if I were to compare with the Westminster system, for instance, he combines the power to lead a government as prime minister, as well as the head of the state, the head of state. That, that is too powerful, even more powerful than the, the United States president in that uh, a president is also a member of parliament, whereas in the United States, the president is not a member of the Congress is entitled, and I think that is the wish of some of the people generally popularly that uh, the president must be able to appoint ministers from outside government. That is a matter for consideration as well. So that the ministers are relieved of the demands of the constituencies because sometime and I've known ministers working hard day and night to certify the requirement of the state as ministers of their offices, as well as satisfying the needs of their constituencies, but with very little time. I've, I've known situation where the ministers of foreign affairs find it difficult to organize their offices as well as their 
offices in the constituencies. There, there is popular belief that the vice president of the, of the country should always be a running mate instead of being a choice of the president alone himself and parliament being required merely to endorse. Whereas when the vice president he becomes a running mate of the president of the party, then he is elected just like the president and, and, and consequently there could be no complaint that the president maybe favored an individual at the expense of another individual. Whereas uh, if someone has been elected by the people themselves, that is what people require. There is suggestion, for instance, there was suggestion, for instance, that apart from the, 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 the former presidents or the former presidents, uh, there should be a provision to make sure that the former president is barred from coming back to, to parliament because that will only serve to confuse people. And, uh, and knowing the constitution as it is, where the president is so powerful, it could make the life very difficult as we happen, unfortunately, to have a similar situation where a, a former president becomes political when the, in fact the intention of the nation was that he should become a political and a statesman who is the father of the nation. And uh, knowing very well that nowadays a young man can stand for president position at an early age and probably retire at 45 or 50. Well, sooner or later, we can get situation where these young retired former presidents want to come back because they are still strong enough. Finally, I want to suggest that we must get a leave from our neighboring regional countries like uh, Zambia and uh, Kenya, for instance, where they had the Westminster type system of the constitution, which they have now reviewed and changed. And therefore they have a hybrid between Westminster and the American type system. I think uh, that is a matter for consideration at this review. Finally, I want to say that some of the, and thinking about the future, we should be considering the question of a constitutional court, because we are going to get into situations where there may be some uh, controversial constitutional uh, developments that may require to be, to be considered by a higher body that is professional enough to deal with. Uh, otherwise, if we continue to depend on the, the bench, our present bench that is not specialized, we may find ourselves in some difficulties, but that is just food for thought that in considering the constitutional review, we must take some of these things into account. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, Ramahang. Yeah. And I do believe that uh, you have given us assignments in terms of what to look at and what to think about in terms of uh, taking a leave from regional examples, um, countries like Zambia and Kenya, the hybrid model of the UK and the US, the thought of the constitutional court, and obviously um, the history and looking back to 1997. But you spoke highly also about the issue that, that relates specifically um, to the oversight. Um, the question that is there is what institution do we, institutions do we have uh, that supports democracy, which is the core of the constitution? The oversight, the separation of power, like you've rightly talked about, Mem Manasha, and at the time is uh, Deputy Re Pono Mathudi, uh, talking about the independence of the, uh, the constitution of uh, the parliament, rather, of the um, Republic of Botswana. Let's not forget the topic that we're discussing here, a comprehensive and not a piecemeal review, voices from the ground. What are some of the key greatest takeaways you can highlight from the current constitution? Why constitutional review? And why are we talking about it now? The shortcomings of the current constitution, what is envisioned, envisioned uh, for the updated constitution? And at this particular juncture, I would like to call a man who spent many years because in jail in South Africa because the constitution at the time allowed that to happen. He's a former member of parliament and also um, for money of opposition and parliament, he will speak from his seat. He represented Botswana National Front in 1993 as his, vice, as his deputy president, um, and winning the seat in Habarane Central um, in 1994. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome the author, a gentleman of note, Re Michael Dingake. Say your time is starts now. I'm sure the camera will be able to pan quickly to him. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wish to also recognize all the participants here. This is very important. Talk about the review of the Constitution. Let me say all what we call observed. Now, we are discussing a very, very important document in the process of government, the Constitution is very, very important. Now, first of all, we are a democracy. And of course, in Africa, we are very, very proud that uh, we, in fact, were among the first few democratically entire of governments. That's something that we must always be proud about. But um, democracy is, is easy to define. And the uh, one definition that is known worldwide and is supported is the one that was made by Abraham Lincoln. Democracy is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Now, 
God will do it. We have And uh, it is run by people who are concerned in that particular uh, space. And it is for the people. The people must benefit, you see, from the government they install at any time. Now, it's good that we are reviewing our constitution after so many years. Quite a number of people are already grumbling that it has taken us ages, you know, to review the constitution. And uh, some say the reason, this is the reason why there's always been one, there's always been one party since the independence of the country in 1966. I wouldn't complain very much about the length of time that it takes you know, to review the constitution because once you make a constitution or you agree on a constitution, you expect it to last you know, for generations. It is not just a one-off um, thing. You have a constitution that you expect you know, to last for ages. But reviewing the constitution is important because society is dynamic. Society is on a movement and it's, it can be moving very, very fast. At times it appears to slow down, but uh, the general trend is that society is very dynamic and very uh, speedy. So that uh, constitutions must keep pace with the development you know, of society as society now develops. Now, there are a number of things that we must take in mind, we must take note of when we review a constitution like we are doing now. First of all, because democracy is by the people, of the people, and for the people. The people must, must always be the center. They must always be the center of this review of a constitution. In other words, people must be educated on democracy. Why democracy? Is democracy really of the people, by the people, and is it for the people? If not, we must try to bring ourselves close in order to this definition. We must be invo involved in our constitution. Now, it is important, very, very important that people must know and understand, you see, their needs. What do we, do we need, you know, as people? We need, of course, as it is said, government is for peace and public order. 
and security, we must always aim you know, at these targets. <clears throat> now, to get into what one may see as you know, lacking in our constitution. Processes that may, maybe do not really take us, you know, to where we want to, to go. Um, we must examine some of the processes, you see, of government and the structures of government. Processes and structures of government very, very important. Structures of government in our democracy, of course, is that we have got uh, three pillars, you see, of government. Pillars that are supposed to be separate and independent, and yet interdependent. At the top, you must have the presidency. You must have the legislature, the legislative assembly. And you must have, of course, the judiciary. This is absolutely important. This structures or institutions must be separate and equally but at the same time, they must be interdependent. If we look at our constitution, a separation of powers, of course, is very much underlined. We always talk about it. We talk about separation of powers. The executive, that is the presidency, parliament, the legislature, and um, the, the people themselves have to be committed in order to responsibilities they're given by the Constitution. And when they quarrel, because you always do. When there is conflict you know, among us, and you need somebody, you see, to judge uh, on whether we are observing, you know, the, the, the laws that we have made, you know, for ourselves. We need the judiciary. Now, I think in reviewing our constitution today, we must think of how we appoint our, our executive presidency. President is not directly, you know, appointed or elected. I think in reviewing the Constitution, we must concentrate a bit, you see, on how we elect, you know, uh, the Constitution, I mean, the, the President. I personally think the President, you know, must be elected directly. Quite a number of countries are doing so. The United States being a very good example. But we may not follow the example of the United States from top you know, to bottom. The president of the United States is elected by all the people. But <clears throat> He's not a member of, of parliament, for instance, or Congress. One would have liked to see the president 
being also a member you know, of Congress, so that now and then he can answer as a top man and answer questions directly, you know, from members of Congress or Parliament. We need the president, you know, to be directly, you know, elected. It's absolutely important. And then as far as you're concerned, is it, is, is it enough to have parliament and judiciary? Are these institutions sufficient, you know, to maintain uh, the processes that we have, you know, to achieve the peace and public order and harmony that we 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 need and we need to have, you know, in society. I am very much impressed by what the South Africans call the chapter nine, you know, institutions. I think the chapter nine institutions uh, are very, very important. Very, very important to have. Because in a way, if a populace is mindful of what their needs are, and they can use, you see, these institutions to put the government, you know, on track if they deviate or go out of uh, out of the rail. We saw what happened, you know, in South Africa under the institution of or the of uh, the, the, the public protector. But this, there are other, of course, uh, structures like the High Committee, the Commission, the High Commission of Human Rights, and Commission of Gender Equality, and the other commissions. These commissions help you know, to give the government, you know, in line. Otherwise, government, because we are human beings, can easily be derailed. We are not always, you know, in agreement in what we do. But we can have, you see, structures and men. Uh, that sort of progress, you see, and bring us, you know, into, into line. I think this are some of the institutions that we really need. The public protector, here we, we say the ombudsman. Uh, but the ombudsman we have, you know, must be armed, you know, with powers. It can help you know the process of government. There are quite a number of other things that one looks at um, on elections. Are our elections free and fair? Free, we may say yes, but are the elections fair? There is no political party funding, whereas in other democracies, we have this political party funding. Because campaign in the elections is very, very expensive. And uh, all parties, you know, need assistance. This is something we must look into when we Think of you know of review of constitution. Also, 
the question of independence see, of the institutions, like for instance, executive parliament and so on. Um, the government or the, the executive is supposed you know, to execute, execute you know, the laws that are made in parliament. But is it right that the, 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 the president must on his own appoint certain people or certain structures in the government? This must be looked into. The, 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 the president must not be allowed you know, to be on his own in electing or appointing certain structures. For instance, can we be certain that uh, the judiciary will be independent if they believe, you know, they have uh, been done a favor by, by being appointed by the, the president, when they favor the, the president whenever they make judgments? in cases where an individual is supposed to is, is against, you know, uh, government. We must think about this. And uh, we must also think about what happens in parliament. I mean, is parliament really independent. Our MPs, fortunately nowadays you can see them in parliament, I mean, through the PBTV and listen to what they say uh, over the radio. Are they, are they all the time thinking of the people they represent? We know in Parliament, the, the government, you know, uses this majority. And uh, sometimes when members of Parliament, you see, of the ruling party, don't agree with motions or laws or bills that are brought forward, you know, by the government. You know, they'll... Uh, they're always, of course, support you see this. Place. But motions that come, you know, from the opposition, it doesn't matter how, how valid and how important, you know, to society these motions may be. They are rejected just because it is the opposition. Now, we need, of course, a system that make and make, you know, create, you know, oversight institutions that can make, you know, parliament work as independent and make the, the executive, you know, uh, independent. The judiciary as well. I did politics and the, uh, I used to, I mean, at, 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 at university, and I used to wonder whether it was possible, you know, for some of this independence, you know, to be, to be had. And, I mean, judges, you know, are human. Uh, how do you make judges, you know, independent when they've got friends and that? Uh, so on, relatives. How do we do it? Well, my tutor, lecturer, used to say, well, two important things, you know, in making a, a point is you see to organs of government, you know, independent. First of all, remuneration. 
people appointed in other positions in government they must be you know properly remunerated because if they are not then they can be bribed they can fall into corruption so it's important you know to have um a good remuneration for for these people appointed you know, in positions of authority. Now, the second thing, of course, is uh, the question of tenure. If somebody is brought into a position where he is not certain, you know, whether he's going to be appreciated, you know, for any time, then um, such a person cannot be really committed, you know, to, see, to his office. So the question of, um, of tenure is important. It is good, you know, that uh, as far as the judiciary is concerned, of course, they are assured, you know, of their positions until a certain age. It's not easy, you see, for judges, you know, to be removed. Now, where they are removed, you know, without something that uh, satisfies the community and the judiciary, the personnel you know, in the judiciary, then you may have an unreliable you know, judiciary. There are quite a few other things that I would like you know, to, for us you know, to not only you know, this forum, but <laughs> But the public at large, by the public at large, someone in the room is connected here. Can we please log off with the tent, please? Somebody, somebody in the room. That's right. Okay. This is my yeah, let's, let's, let's try it and then, uh, um, I expect that I have a to wrap it up and then, uh, and then I'll have to uh, take it easy time. Thank you, sir. Yeah, um, I've, I've, I've gone off, you see, because of uh, I've gone off because of uh, this interference, but um, I would also like to come to the question of uh, special elected, you know, uh, members of parliament, for instance. We had <clears throat> right from the onset of our independence, specially elected members of parliament, four in number at the time, but uh, recently, a few years back, and the ruling party decided, you see, to, to add two more, six, they are now. Now, these members, these specially elected members of parliament have not a, a, a definite, you know, constituency. They haven't got a definite, you know, one would have expected them, you know, to, to have a constituency. It doesn't matter that it's not a demarcated, you know, constituency, um, like a district or something like that. I'm thinking, for instance, of a, a constituency like um, like um, disabled, you know, people. First of all, 
I don't know whether today we know how many disabled people we have, people disabled physically and also mentally. Who represents you know, these people? I think we need specially elected people, you know, to represent a constituency like the disabled, you know, constituency. And this six who have been elected, you know, to parliament for no good reason, except that, except perhaps just to increase a number of the governing party. They should be dropped. They don't help, you see, uh, um, democracy in any way. I don't see it. It doesn't matter whether we have got uh, two or so, depending on how many people with disabilities you know we have in the country and uh, what tasks the representatives of these people you know will have. We need you know to have um, these representatives, not the ones you know we have up to this day. Now, I have also a controversial suggestion that I want to, to make to Botswana in considering the reviewing you know, of the constitution. We are, I don't know whether it's few, but uh, we are one of the states, you know, in the world who still uphold the death, the death penalty. Now, I think it is high time that we abolish, you know, the death penalty. First of all, because um, the death penalty, I see it, and you can look at it, you know, from all angles. It's not a deterrent, it's not a deterrent, but merely a, a retributive, you know, action that the government, you know, takes against people. Must be, be retributive against our human beings. I think the death penalty has come under review and discussion, you know, in our, in our country. Quite a number of countries I know, you know, have done away, you see, with the, um, setting aside, you know, the death penalty. But uh, with those uh, ways... Okay. Um, I just currently come from the bathroom from side and I hope our uh, last two interviews uh, could be used uh, later on in a particular session. If I may just say. Uh, I beg your pardon. I can hear. I can hear. Thank you. Can I hope our uh, can be uh, the last points that you would like to make because I'm looking at time. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can I come and ask you to uh, talk about them in a particular session later? Yeah. Okay. I have this time. I think this should be my last point. Okay, this is the Thank last you. Oh, you meant that was your last point. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm back here. Thank, thank you, Reading. I get 93 years old speaking from, from your mind. That's very impressive. Could we kindly give him another round of applause, please? Thank you. 
Um, the last two points, I, I had a, a lot of agree, uh, people agreeing in the room, uh, led by Mamo Hoyo on the issue of the death penalty, of course. Uh, you also spoke about the constituency, which was explained to me in a very different way from a political point of view, not necessarily the area of surface, but the people represented. Because that's, that's a different way of looking at it. It's not an area of Khaborone Bonington South or Khaborone Central where we are, but it's more of a constituency of people represented in parliament. I had a lot of agreement uh, from, from the audience here, obviously, and uh, speaking about uh, the stakeholders of uh, those when Reading I guess, spoke about disability, people living with disability. There was a lot of agreement here in the room. Um, on, your, on our program, there is mention of obviously his honor, the former vice president of the Republic of Botswana, Dr. Pona Tsewakidikile. But uh, as uh, Russell Kukwan mentioned earlier, but if you are just joining us, he will not be joining us, unfortunately, today. That being said, I would like to call our next speaker, I understand you, um, in terms of the input from the academia. There are many stakeholders when it comes to the issue of constitutional review, possible stakeholders involving the youth, women, minorities, political parties, the civil society, trade unions, churches, and of course, our academia. The reason for them is to create poll questions, to figure out what could be the terms of reference in regards to the issues to be discussed. Do we need it or do we have to hear it from us as a people? Karakati. Democracy is the people by the people by the people. From standard four, I've been singing that song all my life. Now all of a sudden it's coming to hit me to understand it even on this particular workshop. Now, when we speak about the three arms of government, where do we include the people in there? Shouldn't we be the fourth arm as a people? Just food for thought. Let me call upon um, from uh, the University of Botswana. Associate Professor, Department of Law, Professor Bonolo Dinogopila, uh, to give us his thoughts on the topic. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me see uh, all protocol observed, uh, lest I uh, academics, we sort of do not know protocol that much. So I don't want to be in trouble. And also just to say that uh, it is an honor really to be invited to speak amongst the greats um, in this very, very important, important topic that has plagued the minds of academics for years and years and years. Uh, we are truly excited that this process has finally come uh, to fruition, that we'll see it happening in our lifetime. Um, and therefore, it is important that we, we really appreciate and acknowledge how historical this is going to be, that we are going to come up with a constitution that will possibly speak to and include everyone and will not leave anyone behind. Um, it is also perhaps necessary to point out that the process comes at a time when we have been plunged into, uh, into a crisis, which to me, I think it is a blessing in disguise. Uh, it has amplified all the challenges and all the problems that we have been speaking to and arguing for. We have seen issues of socioeconomic access coming to the fore, clearly highlighted by the pandemic. We have seen issues relating to uh, the basic freedoms that we usually take for granted, uh, brought to the fore by the circumstances that have been imposed upon us uh, by the pandemic. So, however, I hope it will not be a pandemic constitution uh, with us preoccupied 
with uh, dealing with the challenges that we are facing today uh, brought about by COVID-19. I, I hope uh, we will appreciate the challenges that we are facing today as a lesson and what we possibly need to, uh, to do or to deal with in order to, uh, to come up with a better constitution. The issue is, or when we were invited, we were asked to speak to what perhaps could be included in the constitution, what lessons could be learned. I would like perhaps to, uh, for us to look at it from another perspective and to say, who is better placed than the people to tell us what should be included? Not the technocrats, not the academics, not um, those who believe uh, perhaps have the voice, but the people from the ground to tell us what should be included in the constitution. And to that end, participatory constitution making is important. It's an important process that perhaps we should uh, aspire to achieve in this process that we are undertaking of uh, reviewing the constitution uh, and coming up with, uh, with, uh, with a new constitution. At the, uh, at the most, we should make sure that uh, the process is inclusive. Uh, persons with disabilities, the elderly, children, youth, and every uh, co constituency that you can think of uh, should be included in the process of constitution making. The other thing that perhaps is also important is the fact that we should be innovative in our approach uh, to this process of constitution, constitution making. Innovative uh, ideas exist out there. I attended a conference some time back uh, where we're dealing with uh, innovative ideas and constitution making. One of the interesting things that I picked from that conference was the issue of the incumbency advantage. An instance whereby a, a sitting president, a few uh, months or a, a certain period before elections, he is expected to vacate his seat because uh, normally uh, government resources are used to are used to uh, for uh, for political uh, party and, and 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 canvassing for uh, for votes. So the political uh, um, incumbency advantage rules in other African countries. Other African countries have been adopted to deal with this uh, with this issue. So we are not short of ideas. There are other countries that have gone through this process where they have come up with uh, better ways on how to make sure that the judiciary is independent, how to make sure that the executive powers are properly limited, and how to make sure that the institutions that uh, guarantees the rule of law, constitutionalism, and democracy are engineered in a manner that is not uh, designed for them to fail, but for them to be able to effectively hold our government to, uh, to account. All the points that have been raised by the speakers before me indicates that at the heart of everything is the limits of power, the rule of law, and if we use the most general term, the aspiration to ensure that Botswana rem remains a constitutional democracy, we continue to adhere to the principles of, uh, of constitution constitutionalism. So this process is an opportunity for us to continue uh, to show the world uh, what we can and what we can achieve. Uh, it should not be taken as, a, as an opportunity uh, for us to be self-serving in the sense that we should not try to make sure that we, uh, we entrench our positions. For example, the executive trying to make sure that it continues to enjoy excessive power and the president also uh, 
continue to enjoy unlimited power of appointing almost all the key uh, officers or uh, persons who are heading offices in the, in the jurisdiction, such as the judge president uh, of the Court of Appeal, the chief justice, the attorney general, ETC, ETC. It, it is an opportunity for us to understand that we are designing this constitution for future generations and they are going to be stuck, possibly as we have been stuck with this constitution for many years. And therefore it is important for us to appreciate that um, we should not be self-serving in our approach and conduct towards uh, coming up with this, uh, with this, uh, with this constitution. Um, and I think we should appreciate this, that our constitution somehow has helped us and served us good. Some are saying it is because of our leaders. Uh, some are saying uh, it is because of the technocrats and those who are driving the constitution alongside the politicians. Uh, and some are saying perhaps it's the grace of the Lord that has sustained us uh, to the extent that we have not seen the extent to which the constitution can be used in its current form can be used to, to illustrate and to oppress uh, and to oppress the oppress the people. Now I'm not speaking for the for the academia because agency is a very complicated thing. I'm speaking as an academic, and I can assure you that. In the academia, this process of reviewing the constitution, speaking to what is limited, speaking to the inadequacies of the constitution, we have started it a long time ago. A lot of ink has been spilled on issues that have been raised before today. Issues relating to the independence of the judiciary. In issues relating to, for example, why do we have an industrial court that is appointed outside the parameters of the constitution, despite that it is considered to be a superior court. Issues relating to the limits of power of the executive and the power of the president to be specific. Issues relating to the Bill of Rights and the constitution as it is, it is limited. Um, the limitations that are imposed on the rights that people say we enjoy under the constitution. If you go through that constitution, you'll see that there are a lot of limitations uh, that have been imposed on, uh, on the extent to which we can enjoy those rights as citizens. Um, so socioeconomic rights, for example, we are always speaking to and asking government to include, to, to, to amend the constitution to include socioeconomic rights. The place of international law, one of the things that our constitution omits to do is to specifically spell out what is the place of international law in, uh, in, in, in Botswana. Um, uh, and therefore uh, we are left to, uh, to the courts to, of course they have made sure that they come up with a, a, a position that is influenced by uh, our past. Uh, and therefore this is something that also needs to, uh, needs to change. Um, also, Reading, I mentioned the issue of uh, the death penalty. And I think we should be, go wider to speak about forms of punishment generally, corporal punishment uh, as well, and issues of civil imprisonment uh, as well. We need to look at those uh, and see and ascertain whether they have a place in a democratic uh, society as, uh, as ours. So, as I was saying, in the academia, we have uh, spoken to a lot of issues. We are sometimes accused of uh, being uh, in an ivory tower of sorts, but I can assure you that with respect to this particular issue, uh, it has given us sleepless nights and we have uh, spent a lot of time thinking and coming up with uh, with solutions across disciplines, be it sociology, be it political science, be it law, be it humanities, where they speak about the, the, use, of, uh, the use of language. If you read, for example, uh, Professor 
uh, Nyatirama Hobos works on the use of language. Uh, she's not from she's not from 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 law. She's writing from a totally different uh, discipline uh, from from ours. But we have the same voice where it has become very imperative that our constitution recognizes everyone and is inclusive in all material respects, not uh, playing lip service as uh, it appears to it appears to to do. So, having said that, I think I can uh, I can conclude by saying, the academia is ready. I believe I can speak for my colleagues in the academia now, uh, because there is evidence of their readiness to assist in this important important exercise. Uh, to the extent that um, not only should the academia be represented in the process, but alongside this process, the academia should be given the opportunity uh, to assist and to use uh, its uh, um, capabilities and, 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 and gifts to be able to give back to the, uh, to the society. I, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, having a team of eminent researchers alongside whatever constitutional review committee, whatever, if it is called a commission, to assist and to provide them with answers and to provide them with ideas as they go across the country uh, to, uh, to, carry out the, uh, to carry out the process. I understand that in the 1965, 1966, leading to 1966 constitution, there were about 160 something cons consultations across the country. Uh, that is understandable because of the circumstances then, because we had like two or one kilometer of third road at that time. But uh, I believe now we are at a point whereby we can make sure that this process is, uh, is inclusive, it is consultative, and it leaves no one, uh, no one behind. Um, having said that, uh, uh, I would like to, to say that it is indeed an exciting time in our, uh, in our times, if I may say that, that we see this uh, coming to, uh, come to fruit. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Nogopilo. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, in the context of, uh, thank you very much for keeping to time, and I'd love to uh, request all the upcoming speakers to try their level best to keep to time. Um, where, and you, you spoke about what do, you know, the, the, the academia is ready. I, I like that. And I really love that, that where you will play your part, you will play your part as the Academia of the Republic of Botswana. And obviously, comparing notes um, with other countries that have done a constitutional review, as mentioned earlier, Zambia, and of course, Kenya and other places where, whether they got it right or not, we, we can learn from both ends. At this particular juncture, I'd like to call uh, Director of Governance and the Ministry for Presidential Affairs and Governance, uh, Governance and Public Administration, uh, Dr. Kailo Mulefe. Uh, he's not in. I think we'll continue. Where am I now? <laughs> Somebody took my just uh, my usual thing. Thank you very much. Oh, so I was, I was, uh, I was no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Uh, I'm fine, yes. Uh, thank you very much. We continue um, with, uh, with the program, and I would like to call upon right now Mayor Pusetso Morapedi, uh, Bokongo Head of uh, Democratic Governance, thematic leader. She will share with us what they have learned in terms of the, the process of this topic that we are talking about um, today. And I'll, as, I, as I mentioned, with uh, all due respect, please let's keep it to time. Right. Time is not on our, on our side. All right. Um, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, 
Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to you. So I'll keep it short. We, with the support of the of SAIA, we undertook um, an APRM, this is the African Peer Review Mechanism Civil Society Submission. Um, an interesting pro uh, process actually that gives us, um, I guess, lessons to be ready. It actually readies us for the constitutional review process as civil society. So maybe let me just highlight what the APRM is and why it is important and why, why we could actually use the approach used then with the constitutional review, um, review process as civil society. The APRM is uh, Africa's governance self-assessment and promotion tool. It is it emerged out of a growing acknowledgement that the continent development deficit owed a great deal to failures of governance, something that only African countries and in partnership, I like to highlight with civil society and the private sector could remedy. So the APRM was, was, was uh, created and driven by Africans for Africans and is an autonomous agency within the African Union system. So through a series of voluntary pro governance peer reviews, member states diagnose deficiencies, propose solutions, share best practices and follow recommendations. And that's exactly what we did. Um, Botswana acceded to, to the APRM in 2019. Government is yet to do its consultations, but we thought as civil society, we could take the lead um, as the connectors between government and the citizens to write our own submissions. And then that's where the lesson is really for the constitutional review, that as, as government prepares itself, be it in establishing a commission or a committee or a committee of experts, that as civil society, we could also be in the process with our government, but also advise that the constitutional review process be as transparent and as accountable as possible. I am glad to say that the issues that I would have highlighted as the governance issues that we submitted in our submission actually um, are echoed or echo with the speakers before me. Uh, issues on human rights, separation of powers, public service and decentralization, citizenship, citizen participation and economic inclusion, transparency and accountability, vulnerable groups, education, looking at quality education, sustainable development, natural resources management, access to land and infrastructure, food security, crime and security, foreign policy, research and development. These were the governance, 12 governance issues that we submitted. And these could also be some of the issues that, as Re, uh, you know, Kopila was saying, that we've been reviewing the constitution, we've been in the process of reviewing the constitution, that this could also be our submission um, for, the, for the constitutional review. Now, the lesson also is to look at what can government put in place, particularly um, as Honorable um, Kulu was saying, that it needs to be a peaceful, um, the, the peace we have must be a status quo moving forward in, in the review. I don't know what the fear is actually, in that if we're reviewing, it's just like the APRM mechanism or the APRM tool. If we're reviewing the constitution, we're actually looking at what we have, what is giving to us, how we're benefiting from it and where the deficiencies are. That's, that's it. And then from there, do the necessary. I don't know where the fear is. I don't know why the fear that somehow it could cause any insecurity or instability. So one thing that I'll highlight from, this, from the civil society and as a member of Bukonga and from the democratic governance um, cluster is that it is high time we actually saw a movement from government side on the constitutional review process by giving us a roadmap of how it's going to be done whether we're going to have a commission or a committee, who the people in this committee uh, will be, and hopefully we'll have all sectors, private sector included, civil society included, faith-based, all the different groups, marginalized groups, 
underrepresented groups being part of this committee or commission. We need to already have a, an approach of how the submissions, particularly submissions from the citizens are going to be submitted and how they're going to be analyzed, how they're going to be uh, reported back to the public. Therefore, transparency becomes important in, that, um, in, the, in the process. We need to already identify issues. We need to know of the approach of identifying issues um, agreed upon by different thematic groups, by different caucuses, by different interest groups, and different experts. We need to look into who, whether the committee or the commission is going to be testing the legal and factual integrity of the submissions from particularly from the public and from the different interest groups. At this time, at this point, I think now it's been two years um, or so, we need to have that roadmap. And we can learn on building the roadmap and designing the roadmap from the APRM uh, process with civil society and how we did it. We had a working group. And then from there, civil society organizations, different organizations, different themes, we went out and looked at the different issues, identified the issues, and settled down on 12 and wrote our submissions on those 12. And that's something that we could also learn with the, and apply with the constitutional review uh, process. It will be important to also learn from the Vision 2036 process. Some people would argue that the consultations were not, were not um, done well. Maybe that's also a lesson. How do we improve on, that, on those consultations? Um, in 1965, Red, we, maybe it was understandable that only 100, 100 or so consultations were, were, were done. But now we live in the fourth industrial revolution era. So it is high time we also learn of the approach to be used in the digitalization and or the digitized consultation solutions the government intends to, to bring on board. And I will just conclude by saying, by quoting Albert Einstein, he said that the strength of the constitution lies entirely in the determination of each citizen to defend it. Only if every single citizen feels duty bound to do his share in this defense are the constitutional rights secure. And when we say people-centered constitution, that's what we want, that's what we mean, that people should feel duty bound to defend it because it is theirs. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Puseto, um, addressing this issue of the roadmap. It's, it's, quite, it's quite important that you have a, a campus and a direction where you're going um, and anything that you do. And obviously, those who are not aware, Vision 2036 is our blueprint as a republic to see where we would love to be in the year to Vision 2036. There was a, an extensive consultation done in the republic. What can we learn from that particular process. And I'd like to thank um, so far um, those who have asked for to keep time. I think somebody was, 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 uh, was doing this on purpose. I think Resokwe is responsible for it. Uh, asking Donald to keep time on Remahang, Redingake, uh, and Red Ramsey. They knew that I was going to be drooling and not keep time. And just, just be in awe because as a political student, that's exactly what I would love to hear. I can listen to them all day and have no problem, but I have to keep time. But let's go on. Um, the question is, is there a role for civil society in, consult, in, in constitutional review? How might civil society lead the constitutional review process? What tools are at its disposal? What lessons are available to civil society regarding constitutional review to address these questions? and give us their own assessment. Um, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Erin Houlihan alongside Mr. Adam Abebe from International Idea. Um, and, um, the, uh, let me give them the platform. Uh, I think you can mute us this side and then we continue. Uh, thank you very much.
Good afternoon, everyone. Hello and thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can hear you, Erin. Wonderful. Uh, my name is Erin Houlihan. I work with uh, International IDEA, uh, the Constitution Building Program in The Hague. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with us, International IDEA is an intergovernmental organization focused on supporting democracy around the world. We specialize in the areas of constitutional reform, elections, and political representation and inclusion. We're very grateful to Bokongo and Saya for including us today. I'm privileged to participate alongside so many honorable political leaders, civil society advocates, and members of the public. Um, as mentioned in this section, we will discuss the role of civil society in constitution building processes. And I'm going to attempt to share uh, my screen if that is possible. Uh, apologies for that. Is that possible in this uh, forum? Uh, it should be, yes. Yeah, otherwise, I can share it for you as well, uh, Erin. Sorry, thanks. Adam, if oh. it's possible, I don't seem to see the. I, I, I'll do it. I'll do it. Thank you, my colleague Adam Abebe. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. To the outline slide. Yeah, you're, we are there already. Oh, sorry. Can't frozen. see it? No, it's frozen. That's okay. Sorry, to continue. Um, so the discussion outline is organized into six sessions. First, we'll take a brief look at modern constitution making, and then we'll consider the why, how, what, and when of civil society engagement. Um, we'll close with a few key considerations to support planning among civil society uh, groups and coalitions. Uh, if we can go to the first slide, please. Um, so constitution making, as the previous speakers have uh, very clearly explained, is a complex process and it involves many hundreds of decisions that must be agreed to. Uh, for most of history, of course, as we know, constitution making uh, was dominated by political elites and technocrats who were mostly men. Uh, since around the middle of the 20th century, constitution making has itself become more democratic and participatory, and this is crucial for legitimacy. However, it's important to keep in mind that broad agreement among political elites remains foundational for effective implementation of the Constitution. It provides a framework for governance structures and systems. Um, and of course, it, both society and politicians have to agree to how this is going to work. That said, engagement with the people has today become an indispensable part of the process and civil society is foundational for public participation. We can think of civil society like a spider's web that connects all of the relevant stakeholders institutions and systems involved in a constitutional review and the process to adopt an amended constitution or a new constitution. Um, next slide, please. Why is civil society important? Thank you very much. Um, first, civil society brings a lot of assets to the table. It has knowledge and expertise because different CSOs specialize in particular subjects that are relevant for a constitution and for good governance. For human rights and service delivery, anti-corruption and environmental action, civil society understands what is working and what is not working within the current constitutional framework. Um, in addition, civil society is diverse, not only in its range of expertise and experiences, but also in its geographic spread and its representation of different communities, including marginalized and disadvantaged groups, ranging from women, persons with disabilities, youth groups, indigenous communities, et cetera. Civil society is thus a bridge that connects people around the country with the process of constitutional review. Because of this, civil society is uniquely situated to inform, educate, consult, and mobilize the public, and to connect the public with decision makers that are charged with making ultimate decisions within the review process. Additionally, civil society, along with the media, has the capacity to monitor and evaluate the process and to hold decision makers accountable through increased transparency and where necessary, mobilizing their constituents. By bringing these assets to the table, civil society fosters the overall legitimacy of a reform process 
and can help foster public buy-in as well as improve the contents of the final or resulting constitutional draft. So how does civil society engage? What can they do? As you can see, there are many, many options and many ways that civil society can engage and have engaged in comparative processes. Depending on context and the willingness of politicians and civil society actors themselves to communicate and collaborate, sometimes CSO engagement can be official. They have a formal capacity within the review process. Sometimes they have an unofficial role and work in parallel. And sometimes this happens uh, in both ways. So for example, civil society can be instrumental in promoting the initiation of constitutional change. This can be through direct talks with the government, mobilizing petitions, or even rallying people in the street. Sometimes this civil society push can help politicians overcome political obstacles that are slowing or blocking initiation. Um, a great example of this is Kenya in the 1990s. Civil society can also influence the design of the reform process itself, and this is critical because the structure of the reform process is where we find the opportunities to influence the substance of the text. Um, process issues relate to the type of constitution-making body or bodies that will lead the process of reviewing the constitution, educating and consulting the people, and deliberating and drafting the proposed text. You might suggest an appointed commission, a specially elected assembly, or the current parliament to lead these tasks, or potentially a combination. There can be more than one body uh, working collaboratively and sequentially. The current constitution's amendment rules do mandate approval by parliament and likely requires a referendum, depending on substantive changes. These are a baseline and other options are available. Um, additional considerations would be who is represented on the body, how members would be selected, how decisions would be made, and of course, adoption and ratification procedures. CSOs also inform and educate, sorry, Adam, one back. Uh, they also inform and educate people about how the process will take place and how people can participate in the process. Um, civic education in particular ensures that people can make informed opinions and, uh, and, and engage the, with the decision-making body um, in a way that relates specifically to constitutional issues and not um, sub-constitutional matters, which, which are a different matter for governance. Um, civil society often also leads or supports public consultation of going out and figuring out what the people actually have to say and then feeding that up to the constitution-making body. Um, in comparative processes, it's very common for civil society groups with specialized knowledge on relevant constitutional issues or special relationships with marginalized groups to play a leading role in both civic education and consultation campaigns. And civil society also, of course, has its own proposals and own information to share with the constitution-making body on substance issues. Um, as far as monitoring, I just wanted to share a quick example from Tunisia. Uh, civil society holds decision makers to account throughout the process. And in Tunisia, it was really interesting, one particular CSO basically tweeted uh, the entire process of the constitutional review and deliberation. So who had fallen asleep, who went to the bathroom, how they were voting, what was on the agenda that day, and that really helped keep the pressure up. Uh, next, please. So now that we sort of see the many things civil society can do, um, how do they do this? Um, it's helpful to break things down a bit. So first, there are two types of decisions in a constitution-making process. Those relate to the process itself, the roadmap, the institutions, rules, timelines, agendas, and participation opportunities that will be used. And then there are the content decisions, which have been discussed a lot um, already today. What types of substantive changes do we want to see in the revised text? Civil society is, of course, concerned with both types um, and should consider how to approach the issue systematically. In order to do this, Civil society generally engages both horizontally and vertically. Horizontal engagement means partnering with other CSOs and informing, educating, and consulting the public, as we've mentioned. It focuses on building alliances, mobilizing people to show up at events, um, and researching and developing coordinated proposals to put weight behind um, the opinions. 
vertical engagement then targets decision makers within the constitution making bodies, whatever level of uh, political decision making is happening. So that involves taking the information and alliances from horizontal engagements and channeling that up to advocate and lobby for particular issues. Um, this next slide is just a quick idealized map of what the process often looks like. Of course, in comparative context, it's fairly sequential. This is, this is very idealized, but you'll see that the first two phases of initiation and agenda setting generally involve process design decisions. Um, and there's certainly a lot of activities for civil society to engage in to help set the process um, so that it is participatory and that there are, there are opportunities to engage. And then the latter half of the two phases is really the, the deliberation and the drafting and the negotiation. Um, so we won't go into detail here, but it is helpful to think of how civil society activities can be mapped on to the stages of the process and the different decisions that have to be taken at each stage. Uh, next, please. Um, just to close up, a few key considerations to support civil society planning for engagement. Um, first, and as we've seen today and in other events, it's important to recognize that not all civil society organizations have the same priorities or agree. Um, disagreement is inevitable. So it's helpful to look for common ground and build coordinated strategies on the issues that are feasible. Um, it's also helpful to keep in mind that thinking and planning systematically can be very useful. As we said, hundreds of decisions to be made, a lot of entry points. Um, so it's easy to get stuck on either purely substantive issues um, or purely process issues, but we really need to think through both. Um, don't lose sight of the forest for the trees. It's also helpful to identify specific objectives and target the strategies around these whether that's to get a particular decision agreed to or just to forge relationships to support influence, um, consider how different tactics can support those. It's also, of course, helpful to conduct issue and stakeholder mapping. Uh, it is the responsibility of civil society to make itself an expert in these issues and to understand the political um, implications of them and how decision makers feel in order to try to influence them. And also to self-assess uh, strengths and weaknesses and limitations of uh, different organizations and coalitions. So once this is all understood, it's helpful if possible to develop a written strategy and work plan that are flexible enough to adjust over time, but of course can help to agendas and time. Um, so thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to speak with you today and um, I hope that the rest of the event continues well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much um, from my dear international. We appreciate that, that, that those, those inputs. And uh, I'm glad I could see a, a, a perfect roadmap in terms of what CSOs can do. And uh, most importantly, also in relation to what we as citizens can do. Without further ado, let me, let me bring on um, the last speaker on, of this morning. Uh, before we take a break, but before the break, obviously there'll be uh, there's going to be a Q and A session um, to discuss the topic towards a people's driven constitution, how to achieve popular participation in constitutional review. Explain the concept people's driven constitution and address the ways in which it might be possible to include the people in building and reviewing of a constitution, Professor. Christina Murray, uh, thank you very much. And uh, the time is, is yours. Well, thank you very much. And, and first, thank you for including me in this, in, in this conference. Um, distinguished group of people, obviously, and the morning so far has been really fascinating. And I think actually just about everything I might have said it has been covered. But let me talk a little bit about um, people-driven constitution making first. Um, and then sort of a little bit more practically about some ways in which people have been involved in constitution making. 
I, I think the idea of people-driven constitution making is quite an old one. I mean, I've seen it referred to in relation to India in the 1940s, but it really became sort of well-known, at least in the Anglophone world, um, through its use in Kenya, starting as people have already referred to in the 1990s, particularly when a really impressive um, mobilization no mobilization of civil society and opposition parties pushed the government into establishing a wholesale constitution-making process. Um, and in the 90s in Kenya, the demand was that the process should be people-driven. The commission that was finally established in 2000 and headed up by um, Professor Yash Gai, as is well known, um, picked up that concept of people-driven and really made it almost the central vision of the way in which the commission and then the huge conference that the Kenyans held um, operated. And as perhaps all of you will know already, Kenya had an absolutely fantastic um, program of public education and public participation. So that's sort of where we see um, people-driven, becoming a slogan for constitution makers, particularly in Africa and the Anglophone world more broadly as well. Um, and I think everyone has learnt from Kenya's public participation campaigns, and I'm sure Botswana will draw on some of their experience too. Um, but there are other lessons to learn from Kenya's people-driven process, um, other than their skillful and imaginative approach to public participation. Um, and I think perhaps one of the most important lessons lies in what I understood as being an interpretation of people driven in Kenya and elsewhere as excluding politicians. So people driven in that context came to mean it's people and not politicians um, that must dominate the process. And that simply didn't work. Um, it led to disagreements, um, as again, you will know, in the big conference in 2003, um, a large block of powerful politicians walked out. Um, a constitution was put to a referendum, that referendum failed, and much more seriously, um, many people would argue that the violence that um, followed the 2007 elections had been perhaps seeded, certainly exacerbated by the extremely divisive referendum um, campaigns in 2004. So excluding politicians, a, a concept of people-driven constitution making that was taken to push politicians out simply didn't work. And in some ways then um, the comments made by the minister in opening this meeting earlier this morning when he talked about the sensitivities and the importance of um, building unity um, reflect what Kenyans failed to do in that process. And I'm sure um, the guy will talk more about this later. Now, the second process in Kenya, the one that started in 2008 and led to a new constitution, really learnt from that previous experience. Um, politicians were given a more dominant role than they'd been given in the, in the first one. Um, and I had when I was there in, involved in that process in 2009, I had some really interesting conversations with people from civil society. And remember particularly one civil society leader saying to me that they'd learned the hard way from the 2000 process. In that earlier process, they'd pushed very hard to keep politicians out. They'd pushed to get exactly the kind of constitution that they thought would be perfect, um, and it simply didn't work. So in the second process, the same civil society actors um, were much more circumspect, worked hard on trying to build compromises, um, and 
the result, as you know, was that um, Kenya adopted a new constitution in 2010. I'm not going to suggest that was all due to civil society being uh, more um, willing to compromise. There were many other factors that led, led to that, but it, it was an interesting lesson. And again, um, I think that many of those people would say people-centered is possibly a better word than people-driven. Um, so sort of the lesson I would draw from that, I, that version of people-driven is um, it shouldn't be interpreted as either or. And that's something that has come up in the chat quite, of, quite often already I've seen this morning in the very engaged chat. I suppose that point is also substantiated by the fact that, I mean, I'm going to sound very negative again now, but that constitution making, wholesale constitution making, very seldom succeeds. Now, again, that's a point that's been made a few times today. Um, I've heard Tanzania refer to, Zambia refer to, the other examples from all over the world. And generally, it seems that outside a fairly serious crisis, it is hard to have wholesale constitutional reform. And I assume that that's one of the reasons you're taking the matter so seriously now. Um, but certainly I can't think of a situation in which there's been a really fledged constitutional reform without politicians playing a very significant role. So that is something to be managed. Of course, constitution making should be people-centered. I don't want to be seen to suggest that it shouldn't be that it should be in the domain of politicians. Indeed, all politics should be people-centered. Um, so that's a sort of little bit of background. Um, and my concern that people-driven should not be interpreted as um, excluding politicians, but I would argue what is needed is finding a way in which different se sectors of society can work together constructively to reach the best conclusion one can under the circumstances. Um, at this point, a sort of little bit of time I have left, I just want to move to the second part of uh, my brief for today, and that is to talk a little bit about how people can be involved in constitution making. I mean, we've already heard um, a great deal and um, again, in the chat, there, I think there's some really interesting discussion. Um, so the first question might be, you know, what is public participation actually for? Um, and obviously, there's a general point that it's so that, and I think it was well put by Erin a few moments ago, so that people are both engaged in constitution making process, the constitution reflects the views and wishes of the people. And um, people in the longer term, one hopes, um, will respect the constitution and defend it. But the actual process of drawing submissions from people sort of can happen in other ways. And this, I think there's sort of two broad views about what one might expect from a process of eliciting submissions from the broader public. Um, Professor Yash Gai often argues that one of the most important purposes of a process of public consultation is to understand what people's everyday concerns are. What are the problems people face in life, in their daily lives? Um, what matters need correcting? And then he argues that hearing about people's lives, about their concerns, about their realities, constitution makers, maybe a commission, maybe a bigger conference, um, both um, need to craft a constitution that addresses those concerns. So on that approach, you aren't asking people necessarily for answers to more technical constitutional questions. You know, should this be in the constitution or this, etc. You're trying to understand the lived reality of the citizens of the country. Of course, an alternative approach is that you ask people specific questions. Um, and we've already heard many of those today. Um, 
Um, how should the executive be elected and held to account? How are judges selected? Um, what rights should be protected? Um, how can one secure full respect for minorities and so on? Um, and many constitution making processes do expect people to engage with those questions. But of course, in practice, it's never really a simple choice between different approaches. The answer perhaps is that people will respond as they want to respond. And of course, if it's people-centered, that seems correct. Um, one wants to enable a process in which people can engage as comfortably as possible and a process in which they have confidence in. I think there's sort of two major challenges here, among many others, and um, previous speakers have touched on many others. Um, but one is how to avoid um, public participation becoming very sloganed, simplistic, and polarized. Um, I think it's always worth remembering that um, if you look at the public participation um, and the sort of quite famous public participation in South Africa's constitution making process, we see that the vast majority of submissions came in the form of petitions. And they were petitions for things like keep the death penalty, um, and believe it or not, also animal rights and so on. So they were very much one line politically mobilized issues. Um, and that is really true of every constitution making process I've had any involvement in. Um, um, I think it's perhaps worth looking at the movie, which some of you will have seen, Democrats, which is about constitution making in um, Zimbabwe um, in 2009 and 2010. Now, the film just portrays a, a very violent process. Um, security forces were used, as you will know, um, brutally. Um, and I don't want to suggest that will be in the case the case in Botswana. But one thing that did occur in that Z Zimbabwean process that, as I say, I've seen in every other process I've been involved in, is that people are mobilized to present particular views. Um, working on a constitution commission in Fiji, for instance, we would hear from town to town, from island to island, the same set of proposals being read out, orchestrated um, and very simplistic. So the question is, you know, how can one ensure a more nuanced or build, or encourage a more nuanced response? I don't think you can exclude that partisan and very politicized response in a public participation campaign but possibly one can enhance the engagement. Um, let me use an example that may be a little bit sensitive right now, but it's something that's been discussed so often today, I can't resist. You know, we've already seen, we've been talking, or you've been talking um, about the problem of executive power. And the one answer that, or one issue that always comes up is, um, should you have a directly, or should one have a directly elected president? Um, Yes, no. But of course, that isn't the whole question. The problem, it seems, is hard to um, constrain executive power and how to ensure the executive, the head of the executive, whoever, is accountable to the people and remains accountable. So one really needs to think about that as a package. Um, it's not really about appointment, it's also about... <laughs> Um, I saw some years ago um, uh, NGO, Libyan NGO working in Libya, in happier days in Libya, I should say, um, with a, a very interesting set of sort of puzzles, problems that they used as a form of public education on constitution making. And that encouraged those puzzles whatever they were, um, encouraged people to sort of come to quite thoughtful and nuanced um, approaches to some of the problems that constitution makers in Libya then, that's in about 2012, were facing. So a challenge, I think, is how to um, enrich 
public participation and avoid it becoming mere sloganeering. Second problem, as I've already mentioned, is how to make um, participation um, comfortable for people um, and how to give them confidence in it. Um, Aaron um, has already, and previous speakers have already been through a number of those things, but let me just sort of do a, a quick summary before I close. Um, firstly, as we've heard, um, there's now really, I think, an international norm saying that constitution making processes should be inclusive, participatory, and transparent. Um, so that means one needs good mechanisms for recording people's views. Um, and now, of course, the internet allows us also to make submissions um, transparent. One can easily share what is presented in submission process with everybody in the country. Here, there may be a concern. Some people may have confidentiality problems, not want to be heard saying certain things, um, and it's relatively easy to manage that it has been done. Um, one interesting, I think not very common approach we took um, in Fiji was to allow women sometimes to speak to the women members of the Constitution Commission separately from everybody else. And by doing those closed meetings, as I said, that was a special arrangement. Normally all our meetings were open, but in those closed meetings, um, we certainly heard more about the problems women confronted um, in their daily lives um, in, in Fiji. And of course, problems of domestic violence and so on, which they weren't prepared to um, talk about um, in the local town hall. Um, so the issue of transparency and possibly a little bit of a nuanced response in certain circumstances. Um, and then something that is equally important is perhaps to require any constitution making body to give real feedback and response to um, the views of the public. How did they deal with it? What did they do when they heard um, what people wanted? Um, obviously submissions are going to contradict one another, be unclear and so on. Um, a good democratic constitution making process should engage with the public in some way um, on responses to problems and or to submissions. And again, I think Kenya has really set a, a wonderful standard in this regard. The um, Constitution of Kenya Review Commission um, produced a report in, I think it was 2003, which was carefully drafted to be accessible, very readable, um, summed up the submissions that were made, obviously couldn't be totally inclusive, um, and explained why it had chosen one approach rather than another. Um, I think it would be good if more constitution making processes were as sort of user, people friendly as that. Um, and finally, one sort of small point that I think it's also quite important in designing the process to have a submission process that isn't merely controlled by a secretariat or whatever. A public consultation process can quite often be given to the secretariat to run and do, which it probably should be. But I've seen um, important or valuable results from having constitution makers themselves engage with the public. Clearly they can't do it all the time and they can't be present at every public consultation meeting or whatever. But sort of most movingly, when I was working in Fiji, one of my fellow commissioners um, who had been a politician in Fiji for many, many, many years, um, seemed to know every part of this very, very big country um, spread out over hundreds of miles of sea. Um, and yet after a series of public consultations in which we heard Fijians make submissions about the constitution. She said to me, she's learned more about the country in this process 
than she had in many years as a politician. So it's an important moment to allow um, opportunity for constitution makers to actually hear people speak. And uh, that ideally would inform the constitution. The small way in which it informed the Fijian constitution was that um, they have a right to transport in the constitution because over and over again, we heard that um, it was extremely difficult for people to get from their villages to schools, to hospitals and so on. Um, so that's one sort of rather small example, but the importance of really having some kind of direct relationship between a submission process and the people who are drafting, holding the pen, drafting the constitution. Um, so it's sort of bringing a little bit of real life into the constitution drafting process, which can easily become really quite technical. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, and again, thank you for including me in this truly interesting program. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Murray. Um, I think where we are, uh, you spoke uh, just now about real life and real feedback on issues of the constitution. And I, I want to somewhat start off the Q&A right now um, by a question which has been sent um, on our chat by Hopola Mohotsi. And I would like to direct to you, Professor Murray, um, which issues are extremely delicate on constitutional review, those issues that if not handled properly could lead to instability. That's a question that's coming through. I would like to direct you to Professor Murray. And if there's anybody um, within the, the panelists who would like to touch on it, I'd like for our panelists when they are responding to be as quick and precise as possible, because um, I'm chasing time. I apologize for, for rushing you. Professor Murray. Well, uh, I mean, uh, the first obvious answer is that this is going to depend on what is really sensitive in a country, um, particular country. I mean, if I think back to my experience in Kenya, and again, there'll be people talking about that later, um, uh, somewhat, I think, unexpectedly to Kenyans, certainly to me, religious rights became an incredibly hot issue. But also, of course, the issue of the distribution of power is probably the most sensitive issue everywhere. Um, I think constitution making, when we talk about it now, constitution making is about building a better constitution for a stronger democracy. But constitution making is frequently used or people attempt to use it as a power grab or to bolster up the power they already have. Um, wholesale constitution making opens up a lot of very vulnerable or quite know what the word is, but um, issues that um, also give people space to consolidate power. Um, and I think that that's probably just generally the, the, the greatest challenge is to manage those things. But every country will of course have its own particular sensitivities and difficulties. Thank you very much, Professor Murray, for that. And I've got another, another quick question here. It's, it's, it's long, but I would like to just uh, go through it very quickly. And I think um, that, uh, I'm, 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 I'm pushing it to you, uh, Professor Dinokopila, uh, because it's an academic, academia question. And it starts off by saying that this is an academic question. The manifestos of all political parties in Botswana in the run-up to the 2019 elections were very explicit on comprehensive constitutional review which was commendable as indeed our constitution is obsolete in many respects and has not embraced the many up-to-date necessary provisions, e.g. Um, a chapter on local government and another on oversight bodies. Suddenly, the incumbent government has demonstrated a conspiracy, because uh, obviously it's, it's conspicuous lack of keenness to start the process. What could be the problem? I think you can pull your mic there. Uh, just, just put it on there. Um, you can use it while you're sitting there. I'm sure we can work something out there. For one, I don't think this is uh, an academic question. <laughs> <laughs> and two, um, I don't know why 
Uh, on the question was asked when the EPA can inform the institution and highlight that this is the But of course, we should be fair and say uh, COVID 19 to everyone by surprise. I don't want to give excuses, but I can decide that as a possible reason why the process has been taken. But at the same time, there's no clear commitment from government on when is this starting, how, how far are they in terms of giving us a, a, a roadmap of what to expect when and, and, and how. Uh, because if the, we are rushing on the other side and excited, uh, that's a change. Uh, but to answer the question, I don't have any explanation except to uh, to suppose that this would be one to thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, I would like to, to bring in here maybe um, Ramakang, if he's still with us, um, on this question from Ramudise Mapanyani. And Ramapanyani is asking this question, who should be included in the Constitutional Review Committee? Uh, should the president consult the leader of opposition on the selection of the committee? Um, Ramakang, um, that question, uh, uh, if you'd like me to repeat or you had it, I heard you, but what? How do you want you to answer it? Oh, uh, who, who, in, in your own assessment, uh, when, when, when we are doing the, when we are putting together the constitutional review committee, if there is one, who should be included uh, in it, and is it important for the leader of opposition to be part and parcel of that, uh, for uh, that to be part of of that constitutional review committee or commission? Yeah, we, you are talking to me. You are asking me a question about an animal I have never seen. But <laughs> the important thing is that the opposition must necessarily be included. Whether it is the leader of the opposition or one of the opposition member, it doesn't really matter. Because one assumes that uh, it will be working maybe during parliamentary sessions and so forth. And the leader of the opposition must sit in parliament instead of going around the country. So they might choose someone who represents the opposition. But I, I cannot uh, pontificate what people are going to be included in the commission really. The assumption is that the government will discuss with the leader of the opposition and they will determine the number of people to be included. Uh, everybody has been talking about inclusiveness. Uh, get different types of people of different educational background and political background, uh, even social background to man that commission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramagang. Uh, I would like to ask to, to pose the same question to a man who is, who is occupied that seat, uh, Reding Ake, uh, as former leader of opposition in parliament. And uh, in terms of the inclusivity of that particular commission or that particular committee uh, that would review the constitution of the Republic, how would you like to have the makeup of that particular um, uh, uh, com committee? <coughs> I'm not sure, maybe uh, my mic is off here. Yeah, I think it's, no, but it, it should be on. Huh? That's one. Yeah, no, this one, but did, did, did they hear? This one. Yeah. My apologies for that. Go on. Uh, I apologize for that, I wasn't aware. I thought the mics are connected. Okay, <clears throat> well, as, as, as many people as are representative, you see, of, uh, you know, the, 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 the people, you know, in society must be, uh, must be engaged in a, a commission like this one. Um, 
it is absolutely important. Of course, not even a representative you see of a party represents all the views you see in uh, his party. That uh, was interesting. You, you, um, you'll find you know diverse views in an organization. But uh, the thing is always to get uh, people you think are representatives, you see, to, to come up with names you can represent. I would say um, you, you get uh, people, you know, from religious ministries, you get people from the, uh, the youth uh, sporting organizations or other uh, organizations and the uh, students you 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 uh, you in particular as far as I'm concerned you get you have women you know represented you know in such a committee or commission um you have a the Hosi, you have uh, 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 somebody you know from Bonca di Lata, and uh, you, you try to get uh, as many representative, uh, represent, I mean representatives of the layers, layers you know you have you know, in society as you can. Of course, the uh, academia will be very important, business, and uh, that sort of thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Radhika. Okay. All right, I do believe this is where I, I will end this first session of uh, the two um, and obviously take my hat out to Re Sokwe for starting off this morning. Um, I'd like to end this session here, but uh, I do believe the second session is coming very shortly, uh, moderated by uh, Ms. Clifford. Um, but I'd like to give to to Isabella to, to, to speak uh, to, to, to the panelists for this morning. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I just want to quickly check with all of our speakers um, if it would be uh, all right with you if we start the next session in 15 minutes, so at half past one. If you could just give me an indication um, if that's not going to inconvenience you, and then we can break until half past one and come back for the second session. I, I do believe Bokongo will make uh, that uh, give you an answer within a space of maybe eight minutes, two minutes. Um, okay. Whether it's possible or not, so privately, I think. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yes, I, I have sent messages to all of the speakers individually. If you could just check them and just let me know, please. Thank you very much. On that note, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our, our speakers for this morning, Assistant Honorable Minister uh, Rem Timkulu, and also uh, Dr. Jeff Ramsey, Rem Akhang, Redding Ake, um, Professor Dinokopila, and Rem Mora Pedi, uh, Ms. Holihan, alongside Adam, Adam Abebe, and just now, Professor Murray. Thank you so much for your contribution and your questions. Uh, please stick around for the second um, session as we continue to discuss this question surrounding towards the people's driven constitution. Um, quick lunch and then right back. My name is Donald. Uh, thank you so much.
Okay, good afternoon, distinguished guests and colleagues. Um, welcome back. I hope you've all managed to have a, a good short break. And for those of you who are perhaps just joining us, welcome. Uh, my name is Katie Clifford. I'm a researcher with SIA's African Governance and Diplomacy Program. And it is a great pleasure for me to be moderating the second session of this workshop today. We have had some really great input so far. Our guest speakers have highlighted why there was a decision to undergo a constitutional review in Botswana, the different strengths and weaknesses of the current constitution, and what an updated version might look like. In this second session, we hope to take the conversation a little bit further. So we're going to hear more about how to champion rights and democratic values in a new constitution. We're going to hear about the experiences of some of Botswana's um, regional counterparts. And we're also going to have the opportunity to ask some questions and engage with one another a bit more. So without any further ado, I want to now hand over to Mr. Mugambi Kiai, Regional Director at Article 19 Eastern Africa. Mr. Kiai, how can we ensure that the constitution makes sufficient provision for human and cultural rights, socioeconomic rights, gender equality, in short, how do we ensure that no one gets left behind in Botswana's constitutional review process? Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, all protocols observed. Um, so, again, when, when I look at, at my experience with constitution making, which is really located in Kenya, um, a, a few points are, are very relevant for me. Um, one, um, coming from, again, rights perspective, um, is the fact that in terms of the context and history of the constitution making process in Kenya, um, the purpose was very, very clear. The purpose uh, essentially was first to tame a runaway imperial presidency, uh, but also to create or recreate a society where equity, human dignity, quality, um, and justice and fairness um, were all at play. Um, in short, we wanted to reverse um, George Orwell's uh, animal farm to a place where all animals now were equal. Uh, why is that important? Because equality um, being the center of, of that rights paradigm uh, will then mean that, that we start with the design, the architecture of a constitutional making process that locates um, itself uh, in human dignity, in the human person, in the fact that no one is more equal than others. And therefore that goes uh, straight into even the process that, that, that is part of constitution making. I think in Kenya, one of the quick decisions we made um, in the mid 1990s was the fact that uh, we would go for a holistic approach to making a constitution. Now, um, when you do a holistic approach, uh, the, the idea of course is, is to uh, remove all the clutter that has been there. And, and in Kenya, there's a lot of clutter because we'd had an imperial presidency previously uh, um, after the, the, the independence constitution was watered down. Now, uh, when you look at, at that, it does mean that the question of rights then takes precedence. So when we talk about um, uh, a process where uh, rights are enabled, you will find that there are very, very strong provisions. There's a very strong bill of rights. In fact, uh, if you go to Article 10 of the Constitution, where, which presents national values and principles of governance, you find that human rights, justice, fairness, these are very uh, common words in those provisions. And in fact, um, what you will find uh, also is, is that in terms of the architecture, um, what the constitution then does is that it then presents itself as a, a negotiated uh, document that, that allows for a theory of change that is essentially uh, based on individual dignity. So um, based on that, what what we then got um, was a constitution in, um, in August of 2010 that had very, very clear provisions um, and was pretty much representative 
of the different uh, uh, identities, political, social, cultural, economic identities that are, are persistent in Kenya and the different histories, because we had taken time in terms of the, of the design and the architecture to then create that. So um, what, what happens next? So in the last 10 years, because uh, the Kenyan constitution is, is 11 years old, what we have found is, is that the original pro proclivities with especially the executive to close down space, to become authoritarian, are pretty much uh, now matched with or countered by the progressive constitution. In Kenya, it's actually called a transformative constitution, which uh, is, is kind of distinguished from the liberal democratic uh, model uh, because ours has, has, uh, has incorporated uh, uh, issues like socioeconomic rights, uh, generational rights, um, um, and Article 27, for example, uh, we have we have a you know uh, uh, two thirds gender uh, rule and actually actually what it has is that it has parity it creates parity under an article twenty seven but creates a minimum the floor is a two thirds gender rule and that is interesting because uh, with the two thirds gender rule um, when our parliament deliberately um, fluffed its lines and refused to create legislation uh, uh, to to bring uh, that article to life. The then Chief Justice wrote to the President calling for the dissolution of Parliament. And there was shock because I do not think they expected uh, the Constitution to have teeth. Um, and so, what, ha what has happened is that there's a realization that this Constitution is not just uh, you know, an amalg amalgam of past platitudes, it actually does have teeth. Uh, again, in Kenya, you will find that this is one of the few jurisdictions where a presidential election has been nullified. Again, this is based on the fact that the right to vote is no longer just a mechanical uh, right. Uh, it is something that the, the courts are now taking a, a huge co cognizance of the fact that uh, uh, you know, the, the, the texture and the contours of the rights need to be explored. And therefore, you cannot just have an election every five years and run it willy-nilly. So, so that's, a, that's another good example about it. Lately, uh, there's been a contestation about how to amend the constitution, specifically because when the realization was that the constitution would have teeth, the political class, the political elite, especially led by the current president and the current leader of the official opposition, decided, you know what, uh, let's create a, a, a platform or a, or a vehicle, which is called the Building Bridges Initiative, that takes us down a path where in some of our analysis, I know some people, like my good classmate, uh, Professor Migai, may disagree with me. But for some of us, we found it, uh, it, was a, it was a Trojan horse. What it meant to do was actually open a door to really roll back on, on rights. And, and you, we have found that our judiciary has been very, very strong. Uh, the judiciary at the High Court and now the Court of Appeal have overwhelmingly rejected that process of amendment. So one of the protections the Constitution has in terms of protecting rights and protecting itself is ensuring that itself, the judiciary itself is a core arm of government. So, so as we did the, the, the design and the architecture of, of the constitution, we were very, very clear that issues of, you know, the, the sovereignty belongs to the people, supremacy belongs to the constitution and all of us then lie there. Therefore, amending the constitution must follow a constitutional process. It cannot be extra constitutional. And therefore, that process can only be adjudicated by judiciary. Of course, there'll be arguments to and for, uh, 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 for that. I, I think any good lawyer will know that there's always an, an, a counter argument depending on who your client is. But for some of us, I think we're very gratified to see that this is, is happening. Meanwhile, uh, because of, the, again, the architecture of the constitution, there is a Supreme Court uh, in the country, which is a final arbiter on these on this kinds of issues. And that is where most likely that, that issue will, will go towards. So in a nutshell, how do you protect the rights uh, and, and champion the rights of marginalized minorities on the more problematic or more uh, difficult uh, issues of, of rights? I think, first of all, is understand the purpose of the constitution making. 
My message to the Botswanan people is first of all, you must do the purpose. Some will try and do democracy. Uh, we do democracy, which locates the process in the people. And therefore the people, again, it's not an amorphous uh, term. The people have different interests, have different identities, uh, come from different histories. I think they must all be on the table. And for them to share them the power is, is you make sure that the, the, the process is constrained by the constitution and that the arbiters, so the, the judiciary being one, uh, independent um, institutions and bodies and commissions being others, have all got enough power to balance out with the sword and the pass that have been given to the legislature and the executive. I think, again, uh, recognition that, for example, women, uh, people with LGBTIQ identities are part of the people, are very, very important uh, 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 identities that must be recognized within that process. Of course, you will find pushbacks, but if you locate it as we do in Kenya, in terms of sovereignty of the people coming to the individual citizen, in, in Kenya, the metaphorical term is Wanjiko. Uh, I'd seen Professor Christina Mari, who was uh, part of the process, she, she would know Kiswahili now uh, pretty fluently. Uh, this uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a way to go in my view. Is the Kenyan constitution perfect? No, not at all. I, on this, I think uh, Professor Miguel and, and, and I agree on it with each other. But uh, to correct uh, those imperfections or to try and uh, perhaps uh, address them, what we need is a, is a process that is even handed and that, that um, presents or, or affords equality of opportunity and space to all of us. Uh, for that, uh, I think uh, I have taken enough time and I will stop there. Thank you very much, Mr. Kiai, and for being quite brief. Um, it's interesting, my colleague Isabel and I have actually been doing some research on countries that have undergone the APRN process twice, and there aren't many, but um, Kenya is one of them. And its 2010 constitution was really widely praised, including by the APRN for being one of the biggest improvements between the reviews. So some definite lessons there for Botswana, um, and thank you again for sharing your thoughts. Here to actually share more about um, Kenya's experience is Prof Magai Akech, Associate Professor at the University of Nairobi School of Law. Um, Prof Akech has 23 years experience in legal research, drafting policies and training in African countries. He is an author and has published widely on legal and public policy issues and consulted for local and international organizations, including the APRN, International Development Law Organization, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Prof Akech, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Kaylee. And thank you very much, Saya, for uh, inviting me to participate in these um, very important uh, uh, seminar that you, you, you're um, holding on uh, the constitutional review process in, in, in Botswana. What I've been asked to do was, uh, and I hope everyone can hear me, I, I hope I'm audible. I'd been yes, asked to talk about, thank, thank we you. We can hear you, but we, we cannot see you. Ah, now, now you can see me. I'm sure now you, <laughs> now you can see me, correct? That's right. Yeah. yeah, so I'd been asked to talk about uh, the, the history of, of the making uh, of the constitution of, of, of Kenya of 2010 and, and what lessons uh, there might be for, uh, for, uh, for Botswana. And, and what is interesting is that um, Kenyans don't even quite seem to agree now on, 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 the, on the history. So I think an immediate lesson is that uh, Botswana really needs to document uh, the history carefully because it will become um, uh, an issue when uh, questions of amending the, the, the constitution uh, uh, arise as they're bound to uh, in future. But I thought, I think um, it's, it's useful to frame this question of, of the making of, of a constitution in, um, 
the uh, uh, as an academic, I, I I like to first I mean try to conceptualize, and and I think it's it's useful to look at um, what a, a scholars say about uh, these processes of of const constitution making, and and I think we can all agree that uh, a constitution should be the will of of the people. And, and uh, that is important because it ex expresses their constituent power. And, and uh, because of that, the people should write the constitution. But that, that then raises the question, how, what exactly is the process? What are the mechanics of, of, of making a constitution? My fellow citizens, including my good friend Mugambi Kiai, uh, claim that Wanjiku, the ordinary person, wrote the Constitution of Kenya. And I always say Wanjiku did not <laughs> write the Constitution of Kenya. It was written by uh, elites, whether in the political domain or uh, 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 academics or uh, uh, leaders in, 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 in uh, civil society, who then, um, of course, when, when, when Wanjiku's views counted, but um, in, in these matters often, I think what, what the, the, the person that is holding the pen determines the outcomes quite a bit. So to, to, to be plain, in my view, Wanjiku did not hold the pen and, and, and that has consequences. But anyway, so it is said that constitution making processes should be participatory, but what that, does that mean? It means that the people should determine or if, if they cannot do that, then at least influence the process of, of, of making the constitution and the content of the constitutional document. But then from an academic viewpoint, I think it's useful to then um, evaluate um, the influence that people have in the constitution making process. And um, I would, I would uh, draw your attention to the work of Abraxati and uh, Abraxati has developed a useful framework and um, she sees uh, public participation in constitution making as a continuum that entails four variables that can take different forms and together, because you need to judge this qualitatively, together determine the degree of influence that the people have in any given constitution making process, both, it, both in terms of its content and in terms of its uh, uh, process. So um, very briefly, so the first question to ask is uh, how the constitution making pro process is initiated and by whom, which is a question that I started by addressing, did Wanjiku really initiate the constitution making process in Kenya? And my, 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 my reply to that answer is no. And uh, it is the initiators that set the rules of engagement um, including the nature and the extent of, of public participation. And typically it would be government and or national uh, elite. In our case, in our case um, we had a process where government started the process. The elites did not agree with the nature of the process. They started their own parallel process. And then it was, it was felt um, necessary to bring the two groups together. Uh, and, 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 and it is that process of initiation where you will find uh, um, the constitution of expert bodies uh, that, that draft the constitution you'll find the establishment of uh, constituent assemblies that generate and consider draft texts. And number two, the question to ask is how is the process communicate, communicated to the public and how do they participate? By communication, she's talking about uh, preparing the people to participate. So you're talking about civic education. You're talking about constitutional education programs uh, prior to seeking the people's views and then providing uh, avenues for the educated public now to, to, to be consulted. And then number two, she's talking about debate and uh, deliberation on, on draft texts. And, and that is typically delegated to a smaller body, for example, a constituent assembly. And in our case, um, there was an interesting uh, decision of the courts um, that served to, to stop the process at some point in which the court, court was saying that the act of constitution making can only be performed by a representation. In other words, you cannot bring um, all the citizens of Kenya, or in this case, all the citizens of Botswana to one place 
so that they can make a constitution. They must act by way of uh, representatives. Number three is whether the process is inclusive in the sense of allowing all groups in society to be uh, to, to participate. So the question then becomes, have all groups in society been invited to participate or have there, uh, are there some groups that have been disqualified? Number four, and finally, is the question of who has the final or decision-making authority over the constitution, constitutional uh, document. And from that perspective, public participation is only effective if the public get to determine or uh, at any rate influence the, 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 the outcome. So what you then need is an institutional mechanism for the people to exercise their constituent power, which is where um, um, mechanisms such as the constituent assembly and uh, the referendum become important. And the referendum is, is, is important here because it is um, a downstream, downstream constraint. It, it functions um, uh, to, to constrain those that are drafting the constitution um, so that they adhere with what the people want. But it, it gives the people the final uh, authority, it enables them to verify. Once the process is conclu concluded, it enables them to verify whether the draft document is faithful to their view. And in this sense, it is interesting, and I'm, I'm saying this in the, in the context of uh, the recent uh, court cases that have happened in Kenya, because in my view, we are rewriting history. Um, if you look at the uh, literature, uh, while the theorists agree that the people should control the constitution making process, the question of whether both the constituent assembly and the referendum are necessary remains contested. Whether both of them are required remains contested. So you find uh, in practice that some jurisdictions will insist on a referendum. For others, it will be sufficient that the people elect a constituent assembly uh, that then makes decisions on their behalf. And you can find these examples in Tunisia, in Uganda, in, in South Africa as, as, as well. Um, so what then happened in, 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 in Kenya? And what we tend to forget, and I think we hype in Kenya, we hype our constitution. We um, sort of uh, downplay uh, its considerable um, uh, deficiencies. And, and, and those deficiencies can only be explained by the history which is a very difficult one, which is why for me, it's interesting now that we're very busy rewriting that history, not, uh, uh, and, and while doing so, ignoring um, the reasons for uh, some of the institutions that we have in, in, in the constitution of, of 2010. So at any rate, we had a very, very difficult uh, constitu constitution making process that occurred in, in, in two processes. The first phase commencing in 1997, ending in 205, after the people rejected the draft constitution. And then um, following the post-election violence of December to January, December 2007 to January 2008, um, phase two was then um, initiated. And that is what gave us the constitution of, of, of 2010 on the, on the 27th of August, 2010. And what is interesting, uh, if you look at the, at, at the, at the institutions, um, the, the organs of, of review, if you wish, um, is that while they all were all representative in, in the sense in the sense that all segments of uh, you could find representation of all segments of, of society in them, their members invariably were educated elites. Whether you're talking about it at the national level or at the local level, and um, so for example, the members of these organs were not directly elected by the people, except for the members of the the national assembly who are members of what was called the National Consultative, uh, the National Constitutional Consultative Forum, or N NCC uh, in short. So only a third of the NCC um, comprised the elected members. So um, in terms of the, the process, you had uh, a, a, um, an expert body providing civic education, seeking the views of the people and preparing the draft. Then you had something that could be akin to a constituent assembly, uh, debating uh, and adopting the draft of the of the of the uh, of the of the expert body, the CKRC as we called it, 
the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission. And then at the local level, they set up what were called district constitutional forums. And these were to provide, uh, promote discussions on reform and really just facilitate the work of the ex expert body at the local level. And uh, it was assumed that if went, all went well, then the parliament, the National Assembly would enact the constitution. Um, but that process did not work. It encountered very many uh, roadblocks, including litigation. So one court decided that a referendum must be held. A second court then stopped the process. And so um, it, 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 at, at the time in 2005, it seemed that nothing was ever going to happen until parliament then intervened through various um, consensus building initiative initiatives. Those ones um, never resulted in anything. Um, uh, in, instead, the um, one faction, the, 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 the dominant faction of, of the government, the NAK, decided to um, uh, present a draft, a revised draft constitution to the people in a referendum in 2005, the people rejected it. And that then was the end of phase one. And then comes in the, the second phase. And what was critical about the second phase was the realization that um, um, phase one be failed because there was no consensus among the political elite, particularly on two, conten on two contentious issues. One related to the system of government, whereas some favored uh, a hybrid system of government or a parliamentary system of government, the dominant faction in government then favored the presidential system. So there was a, a disagreement to that. There was also disagreement on uh, the devolved uh, system of uh, government. So it was realized um, when uh, the, the second phase was uh, initiated that unless there was cons consensus on those issues, unless the political elites agreed on those issues, there, there was never going to be um, a constitution, a new constitution. So therefore the Constitution Review Act of two, 2008 was very deliberately designed to compel the political elites to agree on the contentious issues. Um, so it, it then um, established in particular, it gave power to a political body, the parliamentary service, uh, a committee of um, the National Assembly, uh, so-called uh, the Parliamentary Select Committee on uh, Constitutional Review, it was given a very uh, interesting role. Its, its, its primary role was to deliberate and build consensus on the contentious issues. So although the Committee of Experts, the expert body recommended a hybrid system of government, uh, the Parliamentary Select Committee instead adopted a presidential system of government. And that is very critical, particularly in, in view of the debates that we are now having, because some people are saying, oh, the constitution is perfect. Let us not interfere with it. Not forgetting this very uh, critical decision that was taken in, in 2008. In fact, if you look at the history of, of uh, the making of the constitution, the people all along wanted this hybrid pr pr presidential parliamentary system of government not the presidential system of government. So it's interesting that we, we are talking of taming uh, the imperial presidency, yet at the same time, we have through the courts and through these recent decisions on uh, um, uh, a bill that sought to amend the constitution, among other things, to give us a hybrid system of government, we are reinforcing the, um, the, the presidential system of government. So it, that, that's quite interesting from my perspective. Um, so at any rate, the people uh, ratified the, the draft constitution at a referendum held in August uh, 2010. Um, so ultimately, I think the, the, what is noteworthy for, for Botswana, Botswana's um, perspective is to appreciate that um, constitution making is, is a political process and, and our constitution is a compromise document as an, as an, and like any other compromise document, it is bound to uh, have gaps. And it is important to appreciate that the second phase of uh, this process only succeeded because the political elites were able to achieve consensus um, on the contentious issue. So although Wanjiku was frequently consulted, she participated in debating its various drafts, 
The 2020 constitution was largely designed by the political and other elites. So two lessons for Botswana and I conclude. Constitution making processes that ignore power realities tend to fail as, as uh, the uh, Kenya's, uh, phase one of the Kenyan uh, constitution making process uh, demonstrated. And in this, in, in this respect, it is important to appreciate that constitution making typically involves making choices under constraints that inevitably arise due to power disparities in any given polity. In any given polity, there are people that have power, there are people that don't have power. And I think that's, that, that we lose sight of that fact in, 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 in uh, constitution making processes. So that even where, where there is a constitutional moment, they will occur, I mean, the, 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 the making of the constitution um, will occur in the context of these power relations that will determine the outcomes of, of the process, who gets to participate in drafting the constitution, who determines uh, its contents, who determines the outcomes. And that explains why uh, drafting of constitution has, has historically been uh, and remains a predominantly elite uh, affair. It is the representatives of political parties, the leaders of social groups that decide how constitution should be drafted and they shape their contents depending on the distribution of um, uh, political power. So we must really appreciate that uh, constitution making is deeply, deeply um, political uh, process. It is a dialogue, fundamentally it is a dialogue about uh, power. The second lesson is that there really should be no pre predetermined mechanisms for the people to exercise their constituent power. And it's up to them to determine how they wish to exercise uh, that power. And for that, I reiterate that the question of whether a, constitu a constituent assembly and a referendum are both necessary mechanisms is something that remains contested if you look at the practice. And so, as, as I said, there are some jurisdictions that say, we'll just have a referendum. Others will say, we will elect, uh, the people will elect a constituent assembly that then makes the decisions on, on their behalf. And I've given you the examples of South Africa, Uganda, and, and Tanzania, where to, Tunisia, sorry, where um, uh, directly elected constituent assemblies were tasked with adopting the final constitutional text. And in the three cases, a referendum was only included as an option of last resort in case the constitu constituent assemblies failed to adopt, adapt, adopt the text by the required uh, uh, majorities. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move swiftly now from Kenya to Zambia and welcome Mr. Ruben Lifuka, Vice Chair of the International Anti-Corruption Conference Council. Mr. Lifuka served as the Chapter President for Transparency International Zambia between 2007 and 2012 and was re-elected in 2017. He's the current Vice President of the Global Board for Transparency International. And between 2011 and 2013, he served on a technical committee appointed by the President of the Republic of Zambia to draft a new national constitution. Mr. Lifuka, what can Botswana learn from Zambia's constitutional review process? Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's interesting to speak immediately after Professor. Um, he raises very vital points. But for the sake of bandwidth, uh, I hope you can allow me to switch off my video so that then you can get me uh, loud and clear. So um, firstly, I want to thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak to you about our experience in Zambia. It's uh, similar to Kenya in some respects, although there are some fundamental uh, differences. So if I go to the next slide, I'll just give you an outline. I'll speak to five issues. I'll talk about the eight phases of constitutional review processes in Zambia. I'll talk about the challenges that we've experienced. Um, I've been associated with civil society for over 20 years. And in that period, I've kind of engaged with the constitutional making process at different times. I'll talk about the role of civil society from a Zambian context, people's engagement in the constitutional review process. And I'll give a few lessons um, from our end for Botswana to consider. If I go to the next slide. So the eight phases, nearly all the six past presidents of Zambia have at one point or another engaged with the constitutional making process. 
And the point that Prof was making is very relevant. Nearly all those processes have been driven by the political elite, starting with the 1964 constitution, which essentially was a negotiation between the political players, the main political players, and the British uh, government in order to facilitate independence. In 1973, President Kaunda uh, claimed the world's political conflict and turmoil, and in order to unite the country, proposed that um, will become a one party, what he called a one party participatory uh, state. And he did appoint a commission of inquiry or a commission uh, to review the constitution, which was headed by his uh, vice president. Of note is that the commission was not necessarily asking Zambians whether they wanted to go into a one party state or not. It was asking the Zambians what form of one party state Zambia should adopt. So when you talk about people engagement, already you can see that from the uh, 64 and 73 phases, the people were not the initiators of the process. If we go to the next uh, slide. In 1991, following the winds of change that were blowing and public demand for Zambia to return to one party, uh, to multi-party uh, democracy after 27 years of a one party state, President Kaunda had no option. He had initially wanted to call a referendum on whether Zambia should return to multi-party uh, democracy, but the pressures were high. We had food riots, we had an attempted coup. He caved in and decided we're going to have um, a constitutional review process to essentially remove all provisions in the constitution which only provided for one party and would then return to a multi-party democracy. So the sole focus of the commission, um, the Constitutional Review Commission, headed by uh, the Solicitor General at the time, was to prepare a constitution that would usher in plural politics. So, but the, the, they did make some important provisions. For instance, the commission at the time did provide that we should reduce executive powers. Uh, we should also have a cabinet outside parliament and we should expand on the Bill of Rights. President Kaunda's government rejected all those provisions and only stuck with uh, the key ones to facilitate uh, a return to plural politics. But of significance is that the 1991 constitution provided for a majoritarian uh, threshold for a person to become president, the 50%. A president should obtain more than 50% of the valid votes cast. That was uh, inserted in the 1991 constitution. The movement for multi-party democracy, which succeeded uh, UNIP uh, under President Chuluva, won the 1991 elections with one important point. They had 129 seats out of 159. So they had two thirds, more than two thirds of the majority in the house, meaning they could change the constitution as a world. However, the MMD in their campaigns did promise that they would come up with a new constitution which would adequately reflect the multi-party uh, democracy tenants. And they did appoint another commission in 1993 headed by a former minister and a senior lawyer uh, to essentially go out to the public and get their views on the type of constitution that Zambia uh, should have for itself. This was called the Manakatu Constitution Review Commission. It ended its work, if you got the next slide, it did end its work around about uh, 1995. However, 70% of what the Manakato Review Commission proposed uh, was rejected by the Chiluva administration because suddenly the Chiluva administration, which came in on this wave of uh, entrenching multi-party democracy, realized they had the numbers in parliament and they didn't want to let go. So one of the things that they did as a government was to reject now the majoritarian threshold for electing a president and change that to a simple majority among several other changes. So 1996, that was removed, but also another important change that the administration brought about was to include provisions in the constitution on qualification of a president, making it necessary that whoever was going to run for office should have both parents born in Zambia. That's key because it was essentially targeting President Kaunda who had lost the election, but was intended to come back and President Kaunda's parents were originally from Malawi. And that's why UNIP in 1996 boycotted the, the elections. So if we move forward now, um, President Chuluba attempted in 2001 to run for a third term 
Remember, it's still at the two thirds majority, but the general populace with civil society's involvement mounted a strong campaign and rejected his idea to run for a third term. As a result, he elected the person who was initially his vice president but left government to be the president, Levi Mwanawasa, who won the 2001 election in a very contentious manner on a slender majority, and the ruling party lost its uh, majority seats in parliament. And Mwanawasa, in order to make up for what he believed was a loss of public trust, decided he was going to go for another constitutional review process. And in 2003, yet another constitutional review commission was appointed um, and chaired by a lawyer. And Mwanawasa, by the way, was a, one of the astute lawyers that we had, and everyone believed this time around would get the formula right. However, 2006 elections were coming up and Mwanamasa's argument was that we shouldn't develop a constitution simply to go into an election and it shouldn't therefore be driven by events. But in essence, Mwanamasa did not want to bring back the 50% plus one threshold because he was not too sure whether he could master that kind of number. So he, he postponed the whole constitution review process to be held after the election. And in 2007, after the election, he set up a national constitutional conference. This was to counter the advocacy of civil society who wanted to set up a constituent assembly, primarily to adopt and then to allow parliaments to enact. So Manawasa's legal argument was that you, adoption did not have any legal basis, only enactment. And that's why he opted to set up a national constitutional conference in two, uh, 2007. However, it was designed in such a way that the representation was predominantly representing the ruling party and all those that are aligned with the ruling party. So the major opposition party, the Patriotic Front, boycotted the National Constitutional Conference. The National Constitutional Conference continued after 2008 when Manawasa passed away. And this task was to essentially uh, complete the work that the Mongomba Constitutional Review Commission uh, undertook uh, up until 2005. So if we go to the next slide, the NCC removed a number of the submissions of the people. Um, for instance, they didn't uh, support the 50% plus one cabinet outside parliament. Most of the popular demands from the people were removed. And bearing in mind that the opposition were not in full support, a bill was taken to parliament by the new administration of Rupia Banda in 2010. Uh, and it failed to master the two thirds majority needed to go beyond the first reading. So one of the reasons is that Rupia Banda also wanted to use the constitution to bar Michael Sata from running in 2011. But in 2011, Michael Sata won against Rupia Banda and Michael Sata who had refused to be part of the NCC promised to appoint a technical review commission now to pull everything together. He was not going to appoint a, commission of, a constitutional review commission. He was going to appoint a committee of experts to pull everything together. But he said he was going to do this within 90 days, which was an impossibility. But the technical committee did run from 2011 to 2014 and produced a draft. However, Sata pulled back from having the draft taken to parliament. But in 2014, he passed away. The person who succeeded him in 2015, Edgar Lungu, reinstituted the whole process and rushed the bill to parliament. And that's the new law that we have now, which was uh, um, passed through parliament and he did assent to it in early 2016. So the 2016 elections, if we got the next slide, were held on the basis of the 2016 um, uh, amendments. And the 2016 amendments are important in several forms because now it, uh, introduced a constitutional court, it brought back the 50% plus one, it brought in the vice president as a running mate, among others. But it also had an expanded bill of rights, which was subjected to a referendum to include economic, social and cultural rights. But the referendum did not succeed because the opposition did campaign strongly against it um, for various reasons. But importantly, and I had this discussion in the morning, Parliament rejected cabinet outside parliament and they were all unanimous. All the political parties did not want cabinet outside parliament. In fact, the argument was that civil society were trying to use the back door in order to come into, into cabinet. And they were aging civil society to go into the trenches as opposed to using such a provision. 
Now, the 2016 constitution was rushed. A lot of lacunas in the constitution, a lot of inconsistencies because of just the manner that parliament dealt with it. They rejected some issues which were in the initial proposal and they did not tie the document up together. So there was a lot of clamoring for uh, another process to refine the constitution. And the PF government under Edgar Lungu in 2019 set up a national uh, dialogue forum, primarily to deal with these gaps or lacunas in the constitution. However, Edgar wanted to use, still use the NDF to propose to the uh, uh, parliament to remove provisions that would have barred him from running because he was trying to get some provisions of the constitution like term of office to be instituted retrospectively. The constitution came into effect in 2016. He was first elected in 2015, and his argument was that 2015 to 2016 was not a term. The constitution says you cannot, if you've been sworn twice, you cannot be sworn for a third time as president. He went to the constitutional court, which he had set up. The constitutional court ruled in his favor. 2021, Edgar lost uh, the, the vote. The NDF did not succeed, by the way, because the main ruling uh, opposition party uh, did not support the bill when it was presented to parliament and the two thirds was not achieved. And that main opposition party, which rejected to support the bill is now the new ruling party elected on 12th of August. So interesting issue. So let's look at the challenges. If we go to the next slide. So the challenges that I would cite are one, and this is where uh, Prof, I think, uh, was uh, mentioned. This constitutional reform has largely been driven by political interests, particularly of the ruling party. And unfortunately, we've also seen the reform agenda being tied to the electoral calendar. This desire to use the constitution to retain or access power has kind of shaped our constitutional reform agenda. We've not had a clear legal framework on how the constitution can be reviewed and how citizens can be engaged. Our constitution makes specific provisions on what, what to do if you're going to touch on the Bill of Rights. Any changes to the Bill of Rights would have to be subjected to a referendum. It makes specific provisions if you're going to make specific amendments and involve parliament uh, through the different stages of a bill uh, enactment. But it does not clearly indicate how the citizens can be involved. So what that entails is that successive governments have now been using the Inquiries Act to set up a commission. It's essentially a commission of inquiry. And the laws are that if it's a commission of inquiry, the report from the commission of inquiry goes to the president and the president and cabinet will then determine which recommendations they agree with. So that's why the process has been uh, what it is very difficult uh, to achieve. If I go to the next uh, slide, I've talked about uh, the next slide, Isabel. I've talked about the Inquiries Act. Um, okay. sorry. There we go. Yes, so the Inquiries Act and the power that it gives to the president. But what this has also entailed is that we've not had a process, or we've, not had, we've not had consensus on the process because civil society's argument has always been we need a process that protects content. It's pointless to have the Constitutional Review Commission going to the countryside, collecting views, talking to experts, and yet the final document will be determined by the political elite and mostly the uh, ruling party. So we've always been advocating for a process that protects content. But another challenge we've noted is the lack of trust among the different players. Civil society does not trust the politicians. The, the politicians don't trust civil society. Uh, different other stakeholders, professional bodies like the law society do not trust politicians and maybe to some extent other civil society entities. So we've not just had this trust that we all mean well and we all want the same thing. The high illiteracy levels among the populace, I think this came out in the morning, um, Dr. Ramsey was mentioned in this, I believe. Uh, we make an assumption that when we go out to the populace, they know what they want in the constitution. That's why the technical committee did the very opposite of what has happened in the past. Instead of going with the blank slate to the community to ask them what they want to see in the constitution, the technical committee looked at all previous constitutional review processes and came up with a draft document as a discussion document, and the discussions were a lot richer than we've had them in the past. 
Um, if I now look at the role of civil society, so civil society, like I've said, have uh, played numerous roles. One of them has been in advocating for a people-driven constitution. Uh, and this goes way back. I think Professor Murray was saying Kenya, but we've had this uh, campaign as uh, civil society for a people-driven constitution. And primarily because we've seen that the politicians or the political elite have always been taking the lead right from 1964 onwards, and we've not seen the results. And that's why we've been talking about this process protecting content. Civil society have been in, involved in public engagements for, on the constitution, uh, holding discussions on areas of reform, but also participating on the review commissions of the technical committee. They've also been heavily engaged in the mobilization of the citizens to be involved in this process. But we've also been holding the duty bearers, elected members of parliament, for instance, accountable during the legislative debates on constitutional amendments. We recognize that only MPs make laws. So there comes a point where you can consult all you want. The MPs would have to retreat in the house and enact the constitution. However, there's not been that fidelity to the people's views. And in certain cases, that's a point when the ruling party or the political parties in bringing their own views uh, to bear in a constitution. So let's look at people engagement before I close with lessons for Botswana. The people have been engaged in various ways. Some have written, those that are able to write, they've sent written submissions to the commission or the committee through the secretariat, but there's been an open process to ensure that everything received is noted. In fact, the Constitutional Review Commission are all required to ensure that their reports do highlight all the views that were received, but also their final summary. They'll indicate that X number of people submitted on this uh, provision, and these are some of the reasons that they propose. And this is our thinking on the matter. This is what we've now uh, ended up with. But also as an annex, everyone who participated in the process is supposed to be listed. Some citizens or stakeholders have made oral submissions whenever public hearings are conducted by the commission. But for the technical committee, we organize district consultative meetings in all districts, and some citizens and residents were selected to participate. And others have uh, continued to participate in public meetings, media engagements, and other sensitization events. So lessons for Botswana, if I were to give any lessons for Botswana, just six lessons. Number one, you need to build consensus on the constitutional review process. A poorly defined process breeds distrust. I already heard comments about the roadmap. We had that argument and discussion ourselves. The roadmap was held closely to the chest of those in authority and it did not breed any confidence in the process. So agree on the roadmap, agree on the process right from the word go. That will help uh, to uh, carry everyone along. The constitutional review process should be driven by national interests and not narrow interests of the political elite. This is where I differ with Professor uh, Akechi from Kenya. Our experience shows that because the political elite have been involved, nearly all processes have failed. Even the latest one was by and large because we had political interests trying to ride uh, roughshod over all other interests. Thirdly, you need to, to devote sufficient time and resources to the process. And the review should not be dictated by the agency of events like elections. We've seen this in the past 90 days, it was not 90 days, the process dragged on and people now started asking questions why the process was dragging on. And yet there were several issues that needed to be addressed. Number four on the next slide, inclusivity is important. I think you need to allow for stakeholders to be represented widely. It shouldn't just be the political elite and the few urban elites. And that has been a problem in Zambia. The more noisy angels are on, in the urban areas, so what happens to the views of others out there in the countryside, the rural voices, the youth, and the women? Number five, while recognizing the legislative function of parliament, this should not be used to discard the popular views of the people. And uh, the fidelity to people's views should be held uh, strongly. Lastly, and this again is the uh, experience from all these phases, you need to focus your discussions and your debates on the key constitutional principles, as opposed to spending time on legislative drafting. We've seen that in Zambia where our parliament can take the whole day trying to argue on the use of words 
even in some of the consultative meetings uh, involving the people, you want to spend time on drafting. Leave that to the professionals and know how best to draft or to translate your constitutional principles into constitutional provisions. I thank you and I'll be happy to take a few questions. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Lefuka. It's um, interesting to see some common lessons coming through there, but also some differences in the experience between Zambia and Kenya. Um, also a reminder to our guests that there will be an opportunity later to engage around some of these practical country examples. So if you do have a question for any of our guests, please feel free to pop that into the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to move on with the program now and hand over to Justice Johan van der Vestes, a former judge on the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Justice van der Vestes was closely involved in the drafting of the final constitution of South Africa in 1995 and 1996. And it's really a great privilege to welcome him here today to share more about South Africa's experience. Justice, welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me properly? We can. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you very much for the um, invitation. It is an honor to be here. Um, of course, uh, when we talk about lessons, I am not here to be a teacher, and South Africa is not a teacher, but we are all neighbors and um, sisters in Africa, sister African countries, and we can all learn from one another. The South African constitution drafting and constitutional experience has been applauded worldwide. Um, but of course, there is also criticism. In the, in the short time at my disposal, I will mention only very few of the many stories that I have to tell. Uh, but the first point perhaps is what you do will depend to a large extent to the question, why are you doing it? Um, are we talking about a review to make the constitution better? Are we talking an editing exercise? Are we talking um, a process which may end up with virtually the same constitution? That is not what we dealt with in South Africa. For us, it was all or nothing. At the end of 300 years of colonialism and apartheid, we were on the brink of a civil war. The constitution, the purpose of the constitution was not to review or improve or reform what was there before. It was to create an entire new society, a new legal order, and to some extent, actually a whole new country. Um, this, was, this was very crucial and very important. Um, also, it was all or nothing. If we did not succeed, there would have been very huge problems. As you may know, um, the South African constitution drafting process happened in two phases. The interim constitution was drafted near Johannesburg in 1993, years up to 1993. And the final constitution was drafted in Cape Town, um, uh, by, uh, starting in 1994, and having to end in 1996, this final constitution was drafted in terms of constitutional principles and processes set out in the interim constitution. So it was not a process that could go on forever. There was a very specific deadline. Um, if the, it had to be passed with the two thirds majority, if that deadline, which was uh, two years after Mr. Mandela as president was inaugurated, if, that de if by that deadline there was no new constitution, no two-thirds majority, it would have been referred to the committee on which Professor Murray and I both were to find a solution. Early in the process, it became clear to me that we are not going to be to find a solution if the politicians are deadlocked. Then if we could not find a solution uh, for a deadlock, uh, devastating consequences would have followed. Mr. Mandela would have had to resign as president, parliament disbanded, and everything starting all over. So this deadlock, I mean this deadline, and its de devastating consequences loomed large and forced everybody to actually participate. 
Um, so that is very different from a review because one think it is good to review or our constitution is outdated or anything like that. I'm not expressing any views on Botswana. I'm talking about the very specific South African situation. I've said this in other parts of the world, even countries like Colombia, when they were still struggling with um, the guerrilla fighters, et cetera, that, you know, some things, everybody cooperates only when there is no other option left anymore. Um, involvement of civil society, yes, I, that, that has been the topic of other speakers, but I want to say something that sounds so cynical, but actually it's not. You know, there was a massive publicity campaign in South Africa at the time. A lot of money went into it, of course. An education campaign. Slogans were on buses and graffiti on walls. And uh, the public was invited to make thousands and thousands of submissions, um, uh, which they did. And as Professor Murray pointed out, some of them said, what about animal rights? Some of them said criminals have too many rights. What about the victims? Um, some said keep the death penalty, etc. That was a very good exercise, but if you really look at what made it into the constitution, perhaps this wide involvement of the public um, is a bit of a myth in terms of what the effect it has on the constitution. But, you know, we need some myths. Um, we live with many myths in our society, which we need in order to give something the necessary Credibility. I will mention one or two examples later of submissions that did make it into the Constitution. Um, but I don't think the public will persuade Botswana or South Africa um, about the death penalty or how to elect the president, etc. A small thing about South Africa, which we may see in other processes as well, is um, in the beginning, the politicians told us the experts, they said, this is not a constitution for academics. It's not a constitution for professors. It is our constitution. We, the political parties, we were elected by the people and we will make this constitution. And therefore they wanted it to be very detailed because they, they did not trust the professors, but they also did not trust the courts. So they said, we don't want to leave it to some judge 20 years from now, whom we don't even know yet. So we are going to spell it out in detail. So you will see that in many ways, the South African constitution is very detailed compared to all the previous constitutions that became examples in the world. However, the closer it came to the deadline, the more deadlocks there were in the air, the more the politicians started saying, Let's agree on this, and then the courts can later decide. So they became vaguer. And sometimes the very vagueness was the, was the reason why they actually agreed. On our uh, technical refinement team, we sometimes went, they would come to us in the middle of the night and they would say, we have agreed. There's a big breakthrough. We would sit there and draft and we would say, but it is not clear what this thing says. Uh, language wise, it is not clear. So we propose more wording and then all the parties would be angry at us because they would say, leave it as we drafted it. And the reason why they agreed in the first place was because it was not clear. Each party, each politician, each representative could go back to their own constituents and say, you know what, you will see later, this is what we actually wanted. So more and more, the, it did become their job of the courts later to, um, to interpret. Now, this brings me on to the next point, which is related to this one. And that is, of course, courts re interpret what they read later. Uh, they don't know what happened in those halls, and we cannot hold them bound to it. Um, during my own interview to be appointed a judge in the Constitutional Court, uh, some of the people on the Judicial Service Commission said to me, but you were there, you would know what every single clause of the Constitution is supposed to mean because you would know how it came about. And my answer was, there's two problems with this approach. 
The one is the old debate in America, for example, about original intent, uh, whether one really should go to what was originally meant or simply to what is on paper. But the more serious one is if you ask Professor Murray and myself and the third member of our committee that was right in the center of it, we may give you three different uh, versions of what was intended and how it came about. Because none of us was everywhere. Some might have heard something in the men's room or over tea or over a whiskey. Um, so I can mention, but we don't have time, examples that we include of, of language we used simply for plain language purposes, which the courts gave a very different meaning later on. Something which we wrote, for example, as a nice introduction, a preamble to our Bill of Rights. We wrote it, not the politicians, uh, the language experts wrote it because we thought it sounded nice. The politicians were a bit skeptical, but they said, okay, if you say so, it's probably harmless. And many cases that have been brought to court were based on the wording of those. I'm referring specifically to a clause section seven, which says the, the, uh, the government must protect, promote, fulfill, etc., the Bill of Rights. Um, no politician would have agreed on it at the time, especially not the governing party, because this has, if, if they thought that it meant much, because this has been used in many cases by litigants. Talking about public, a constitution for the people, we went out of our way to do the writing in plain language. The plain language movement was then very popular or it was becoming very popular. I don't know whether it is still quite strong, um, but that is a way that even there one must be realistic. I often said, you will never be able to write the constitution so brief and so plain that the whole of the constitution can be printed on a postcard or on a t-shirt, but at least you can try to do certain parts like the chapter on human rights, the Bill of Rights, so that you can put it on a poster on the wall of a school classroom. Uh, so that of course is something that is not entirely achievable. <clears throat> Regarding the, yeah, I'll say something about the plain language just now again. Um, separation of powers is mentioned as part of my brief. Our constitution is firmly based on the idea of separation of powers, but it is not mentioned specifically in the constitution. There is no clause in our constitution which says, which mentions separation of powers. The separation of powers concept is clear from the structure of the constitution. And that is an important um, point in the plain language also. Plain language does not only mean simple words, and sh or short sentences. Plain language also means to organize the material in a way that it follows logically and that it is easily understandable. Now, what we do have and which has helped a lot in practice uh, are the founding values of the constitution. Our section one states that the Republic of South Africa is a, uh, multi-party democracy, et cetera, et cetera, founded on values like equality, the dignity of all people, et cetera. Those values are also often used in court to assist to interpret other provisions in the constitution. Um, so the values linked to the structure leads to the firm conclusion that we do have separation of powers in the constitution. Socioeconomic rights, I was I'm, I'm three points from the end. Socioeconomic rights. The South African constitution was the first credible constitution to include these. The constitution of some European, um, some East European countries in the, during the years of communism mentioned socioeconomic rights, but it was worth very little. Our debate was a very serious one. <coughs> Given our background, Apartheid, colonialism, huge divisions between the powerful and those without any power, the rich and the poor. Um, many asked, but what is it going to help me to have the first generation rights 
like freedom of expression, which includes freedom of the art, what is it going to help me if the arts are free to put controversial plays on the stage of the theater? But I live in the far north of the country in Limpopo, and I do not have running water or electricity or medical care or proper housing, etc. The problem with the socioeconomic rights was many people were worried that it would become empty promises. And if you write all these things in the constitution and one cannot enforce it in a court, if the government can say, yes, yes, we know there's a right to housing, but we don't have money for housing this year. We have to build hospitals. The government can just as well say, we also don't really have money for elections this year because the security situation is not right yet. We first have to you know, spend money on this and that. So false promises in the constitution are indeed dangerous. The way out of this was to use well-known wording in international law instruments. Therefore, we do not say you have a right to a house. You, we say you have the right of access to housing and then we say this right must pro be progressively realized over time, in other words, depending on uh, within available resources, etc. <coughs> um, this gave it a, an air of, of, of realism, but I will conclude by telling you what I think about our social economic rights. The point related to this one is inter the references to other countries and to international law help a lot when politicians are getting very hot under the collar. When politicians fight, for example, in view of the history of a particular of the country, and when you use certain words, say certain uh, terms, etc., and everybody knows, everybody regards it as pro-apartheid or revolutionary or capitalist or communist, then it helps to say to them, but let's look at how Canada did it or how India did it, or let's look at the wording of international human rights or international law instruments, because it gives them a little bit of a distance. They will say, okay, that country did not have our fights. It's working there. We have courts to look at when we worry about the interpretation. So it, it is in a way a mechanism to break deadlocks is to refer to international law and uh, specifically international human rights instruments, but specifically also uh, other countries. The German model of the second house of parliament found it into the South African constitution with our council of provinces and several provisions in the bill of rights uh, were directly influenced by the Canadian experience. Talking about socioeconomic rights, there is one example where submissions did make it into the constitution. Um, as we were drafting the socioeconomic rights clauses, a colleague of mine from the University of Pretoria Center for Human Rights sent in two um, proposals. The one was that we should include the notion of duties, not only rights, as it, found, as it is found in the African Charter. That one got nowhere. Only the far right wing <laughs> white political party, the Freedom Front, tried to push it. Uh, and people said, no, in our history, don't come and talk to us about duties now. A colleague of mine on the panel said, I will leave the country if they write duties. The duties, of course, are there. African Charter says so, but you don't have to say it. It is implicit if there are rights, there are duties. But the one that did make it into the constitution uh, is the Center for Human Rights said, um, give the Human Rights Commission, a chapter nine institution, give them the power to once a year monitor where the socioeconomic rights has been fulfilled and to ask the government to report. And especially the ruling party who knew that they were going to be the ruling party for long, 
said, no, 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 no. And what they predicted is, of course, what happened. They said these institutions will be used to embarrass us, the government. It will be used by civil society to put pressure on us. From our side, we said to them, listen, you cannot write these things in and do nothing for poor people. So it was written into uh, the chapter on the section, on the, the chapter nine uh, institution, specifically the, uh, the Human Rights Commission. However, let me, let me conclude by asking, did it work? Yes, uh, if we compare it to where we were, where we would have been without a new constitution, it certainly worked. Where are we now? Well, people are still poor. I think progress has been made with regard to housing and healthcare, but not nearly enough. There are millions of poor people. There are millions of people still carrying water on their heads. And there are millions of people that do not have access to courts because the process, uh, because legal processes are so expensive. Uh, also on the negative side, there is a stream of thought, especially amongst young academics, that tended, that, who now calls the reconstitution a, um, a compromise and therefore selling out. Those people say that Nelson Mandela was a sellout. They say, Mandela, of course, said to himself, I brought you political freedom. Now you can go on to fight for economic freedom. So some struggles will have to continue. For example, for equality, uh, economic equality, etc. As long as the constitution provides the framework and you will depend on the government uh, with lots of um, pressure from civil society, and from the voters to do the right thing. Our constitutional court, I think did fairly well. Uh, in question time, I could respond if necessary to some recent, uh, recent controversies. I don't mind talking about it. Uh, last example, perhaps a little bit almost um, ironic and funny. In our attempt to have plain language and in our attempt to achieve gender equality, we decided on a certain formula and you'll see it in the South African constitution. Previous constitutions and also even the interim constitution, every clause said everyone has the right to free speech, including his or her right. And we, the whole constitution was full of he, she, he, stroke, she, his, her, etc. We avoided that by using what was called the epicene pronoun. I don't know if the term is well known. We said there, but the point that I'm, the story I want to tell now is when we came to the appoint, to the, to electing a president and the appointing of the head of the army and the head of the police, we said at its first meeting after an election, the national assembly must elect a, a woman or a man to be president a woman or a man to be president. Um, that we did with regard to, for example, the head of the police, we would say the president must appoint a woman or a man to be head of the police. So um, one of the old white members of the Constitutional Assembly from the old National Party, but who had a very sharp intellect was a bit mischievous and he said to us, but are you now actually saying that only a woman or a man can be president and other people not? Now, at that stage, our response was, everyone in the country is classified as a woman or a man, whatever your sexual orientation may be. And we do this to repeatedly focus the attention on the fact that a woman can also be president or head of the army or head of the police. Now, sometimes I wonder if a court has to interpret that now. If somebody now decides that, um, I suppose with the classification, one could still get away, but now that we have the whole LBGTIQ, et cetera, movement, where people start saying, I don't want to be pushed into a category. I don't want to be classified and have to choose which toilet I must go into. 
um, I'm intersex uh, or whatever it is that one may choose to identify yourself. I wonder if a court now would say, no, 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 but look, the founders of the constitution meant that you must be a woman or a man. Now, technically, like I said, on the birth certificate, it will probably still say woman or man, but the initial idea was to advance equality. And I don't know if that could, for example, later be used against equality to exclude. The initial idea was to include whether it can be used to exclude, I don't know. So there are many little anecdotes, but I think I've probably gone over my time. I'm sorry, I don't have a watch and um, moderator. I'm looking you straight in the face here. Thank you very much. And once again, thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Um, you know, we've spoken a lot today about inclusive people driven constitutions and I think you've given some really wonderful practical examples of how that could be possible. And um, we're going to change course a little bit now and open up the floor for some questions and discussion. And to facilitate this Q&A session, I'd like to welcome Dr. Adem Abebe from the Constitution Building Program at International IDEA. Adem, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. And I want to compliment all the presenters as well. Uh, it was very, very useful. And I, I could see Hello. that. Hello? Yes. Can Hello? you hear me? Yes. Uh, before before you, you, you go on, uh, just, just a second, I would like to uh, introduce and, uh, you know, joining us is the Member of Parliament for Khaburne Central. Uh, uh, for those in the international space, Gaborone is the capital city of, of Botswana, <laughs> and the, the, the member of parliament for the central region is uh, one of the most important MPs in our country. So his joined us is here in the in the audience. His name is uh, Mr. Itimeleng. Uh, sorry, Mr. Tumisang Hili. Uh, to me, Tumisang Hili is with us here. I just wanted to, to to recognize him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again. Um, no, I want to compliment the presenters again. I think it was very, very useful. And all our Botswana compatriots have actually been listening very carefully because I noticed that all the flow of questions wasn't coming in. Um, and I think that that is compliments to the presenters who were very clear enough in terms of the message that they wanted to, to, to send to, 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 the, uh, to the partners in, in Botswana. So what I'll try to do is quickly then um, summarize the main issues, trying to tie it together, and hopefully by that time, uh, uh, we, we can have a few, a few more questions. A uh, first point is, is I always like to start from the why, start with the why. And I think uh, from the first session we started, um, there is really no lack of motivations. There's a lot of, there's a lot of issues, um, a lot of purposes that different actors have uh, in terms of why they want to see Botswana uh, go through a process of adopting a new constitution. So, so I think there's, it's, it's clear that there is a purpose, there is a, there is a why. And the second one is in terms of how to do it. Uh, again, I think there's clarity that the process should be participatory. Uh, Christina Murray talked about having it people-centered. Um, but from our colleagues from, uh, from, from South Africa to, to Kenya uh, and, and Zambia, we also heard that, uh, that politic politicians also must have a central role. Um, and I think, um, in fact, indeed, in a lot of places uh, where constitution-making process fail, uh, politicians may be the reasons, uh, but in every place where constitution-making process succeed, uh, politicians are also the, the, main, the main reasons. It's, it's impossible to exclude politicians. Um, and in fact, if we do not get politicians interested enough, uh, we may struggle to even uh, push the process to start at all. So it's very important to remember that the requirement of participation goes along with inclusivity, which requires all political voices uh, to, have, to, have, uh, to have a say. Now, the key question is, if we know that politicians can enable or disable uh, these processes, what can we do? And I think this is a question that perhaps our speakers can address. What did Kenya do? What did South Africa do that Zambia did not do that enabled political consensus? What kind of platforms were created? What kind of uh, contributions did civil society bring in to bring all these different actors together so there's common understanding, so there's, there is more willingness to, to compromise? So we know that politicians are important, but how can we channel their, their energy and resources to advancing the cause of a new constitution. I think that is something perhaps our, our, our speakers could speak to. Um, on the what question, I think um, 
there's there's a there's a, a lot of um, good questions. Uh, particularly today, we heard a lot about about the content. You know what needs to change, but it's important to start perhaps from the process itself. And this has come, uh, particularly from uh, from our Zam from our Zambian colleague. And the key questions at the moment, we don't, for instance, know uh, whether we, Botswana will follow the constitution amendment process, which involves referendum and in the parliament, uh, as a minimum. Uh, or whether it will it will create a new process that will then be constitutionalized first, um, or whether, for instance, will the if there is a committee to review the constitution, will it will that be adopted through through a, a decree by the by the president, or will it be adopted through legislation by the by the parliament? Overall, I think there's a lot of issues uh, that civil society and the political actors to discuss to identify and agree on the exact process, and I think that's that should be the. Uh, perhaps that should be the priority in terms of what kind of process should should uh, Botswana follow to adopt a new constitution, and perhaps how does that? Uh, uh, one of our, our colleagues uh, talked about Botswana vision uh, 20, 2036. How can you know, the process fit into into that that process? Uh, finally, I'll, I'll speak about timing. Um, I think our, again our Zambian colleague spoke spoke about it um, at the moment. Um, you know, we, we haven't seen a direct movement from the government side, uh, but there is commitment, as the assistant minister said, that they want to pursue the reform process. Um, but from experience, the closer a constitution making process gets to an election, uh, it always becomes really, really complicated and, and more difficult. And most recently, we've seen it in the Gambia, uh, where, you know, they had a, a perfect process, I could say, but ultimately, the elect electoral politics started catching up. Uh, and when that happens, it could be extremely disruptive. Um, so think about the 2024 elections in Botswana, how to make sure that you have a process finalized, done before that electoral euphoria uh, kicks in. I think these are the, the some of the main issues that that I, that I have picked picked up. Um, perhaps I have I have seen that. I think there's two questions that have come in, uh, but in the meantime, I think I'll I'll, I'll kindly ask um, our colleagues to quickly speak about. How, in their in their in their views, uh, what enabled the political agreement, political consensus that then led to the adoption of the constitution in South Africa and in Kenya, uh, but led to the failure of the process in, in Zambia? I think you could speak uh, on to that. Um, and then I have uh, two more questions from 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 Tabo, um, and he asked, and I'm going to read it out, uh, particularly for Professor uh, Professor Akech. Uh, on the need for history in the development of the constitution. Um, I think it's he, Professor Akech already touched upon it, uh, but perhaps each of you could speak on that. How can history inform uh, the process that Botswanans uh, want to embark on? Thank you very much. And may I start from uh, the first speaker, from, from, from Professor Akech, and then go to the, our Zambian colleague and South African colleague. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. So, um, in, in in terms of uh, of of, of uh, process, you know, um, as as I was saying, and I think we all agree on that, the constitution making processes are only going to be to be legitimate where um, uh, the people are uh, genuinely involved where the people can really say that this is our const constitution um but but in 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 saying that i think what we we tend to ignore is that um when we talk of we the people we are talking of uh, all kinds of people the rich the poor the young the old um the born the unborn so we're talking about the past the present the future we are talking about very different categories and any constitution making process has to try and, and, and um, be fair to, 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 the, to the interests of, of uh, all these categories that, uh, that, that, that we call the people. And, and we also have to realize that we live in a world in which we have different, uh, people have different um, abilities, people have different, uh, um, resources and, and and that is why people have different histories and and that is why some people will have more power than others so um, to simply say that people will participate in in uh, in constitution making 
without uh, accounting for uh, the, the, the power relations, who has power, who doesn't, is not useful. So the attempt has to be one, uh, let us recognize these power differences or power differentials or power disparities. Number two, how do we ensure that we equalize as far as possible these differentials in power, including uh, knowledge, because some people will not will not have the requisite knowledge to uh, even have voice uh, in, in constitution making processes. So uh, one then has to appreciate those, those, those uh, dynamics. And I think we have so many examples of uh, constitution making processes that have often been uh, uh, frustrated because they did not uh, take into account those power disparities. And, and, and uh, I think they failed, uh, my, in my view, I think they failed. I'm talking about the so-called Arab Spring revolutions in, in Egypt, Tunisia. And Egypt is very telling because um, what happened in Egypt is that uh, following the uprisings, the status quo regrouped very quickly and uh, took over the, the, the constitution review process. So that um, in, in many ways, the status, I mean, the, 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 the new, um, uh, uh, what is happening now is probably much worse from a constitutional, um, uh, constitutionalism viewpoint than before the, the, the revolution. So it, it and, 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 and really it is difficult to, to channel the energies of, of politicians in, in, in that sense, because if you look at what happened in Kenya, it was really it was really out of um, out of we were forced by circumstances to finally agree because for for almost a decade we had refused to agree. Then we have very contested uh, elections in two or seven, two or eight. Many people die as a result, and uh, it is at that um, uh, in 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 the midst of that crisis that uh, if you wish people's uh, eyes uh, 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 are then open. So I don't know if it is possible to say that you will channel the, the energies of politicians in, in one way or another. I, I think from my perspective is just to be aware of these uh, differences in, 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 in power relations and to be able to try to counter them as, as, as much as possible. Because I think if you're aware of them going into a process, you can design um, the process in such a way that uh, it leads to content that uh, uh, takes into, into consideration the, the, the views of, uh, of as many of the people as possible. And then very briefly talking about the history, what I've uh, realized now, um, given what is what has been happening in Kenya in the last year, and in the last year we've had uh, um, attempts to amend the constitution through what, what was called the Building Bridges Initiative. They brought a bill that, that uh, sought to amend the constitution in ways that some people considered uh, very uh, extensive. But what is critical is that in, in, in terms of um, trying to uh, interpret the constitution, the courts are using the history. And, and they're using the history, but in my view, they're not being faithful to that history. So I think for me, the, um, the lesson for countries such as Botswana and other countries that uh, are in the process of, of uh, making new constitutions is that, that histo hi the, the history has to be very, very carefully documented so that there's also an official record of that history because that history will certainly, you can almost guarantee that um, there'll come a time when there'll be a need to interpret uh, vague or unclear provisions of that constitution in, in the future. So from that perspective, it is very, very important to be careful uh, about documenting the history of the making of the constitution. Thank you. 
Th th thank you very much. That was very useful. Um, can we hear from um, our uh, experts from Zambia, Mr. Lufuka? Um, uh, thank you very much. I'll be uh, very brief. Um, firstly, just to make a point about um, the issue of uh, the power dynamics, which I, I certainly agree with. But also we need to recognize that um, there are different levels of engagement and participation by all stakeholders. Uh, we will not have a process which only brings to the table the elite or the academics or the lawyers. Uh, we've seen that attempted here in Zambia before, and it has not been a success. Even the ordinary people out there who have a say on what the final document uh, they would like to see should contain, they may not say it in all the legal terms, but they will express um, a principle which needs to be uh, taken on board. Uh, I think we need to learn from what has worked when you talk about history, what has worked in the past and why did it work and what can we do to build on that? Um, otherwise, we continue to reinvent the wheel all the time. For, for Zambia's case, it is interesting to note that all the political parties that wanted to use the constitutional review process to entrench themselves in power have been voted out of power. The recent one is the one that was voted out of power on August 12th, 2021. So it should say something about the attitude of the people to the intended use of a constitution to entrench uh, a particular party in power. I think the people would like to see a constitution that reflects their will as opposed to one that uh, just propels a political party in power. And I link this to the second point I want to make about the legitimacy of the constitution. One of the reasons why we've had numerous attempts at constitutional making in Zambia is the lack of legitimacy or the perceived lack of legitimacy of uh, a previous process. Every new government comes into office saying uh, the process was not uh, legitimate. It did not command the respect and obedience of every Zambian. We will start the process again. The new administration, three weeks into power, on Sunday, the Minister of Justice was saying the same thing. We're now going to build consensus to refine the amendments of uh, 2016. So this issue of legitimacy is important. The constitution, in my view, should be about the people. Yes, the people may not have the final say right up to the time that it's in parliament, but political elites come and go. And we've seen political elites who are pushing one particular agenda in the constitution now being the victims of the same provision that they pushed for in a constitution. And they're now asking the general populace to move amendments so that you can reverse the provisions that they made. So when all is said and done, a constitution that commands the respect and obedience of all the people is the one that you desire at the most. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I think it's, it's also an issue that the constitution of uh, Botswana I need to, 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 to tackle as well. Uh, thank you very much. Good experience. Um, Mr. Johan van der Weisheiden, please go ahead. Justice van der Weisheiden, can you hear us? Yeah. Yes, please go ahead. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, first, I can hear you. Now, now we can, we, you, you're gone again. Can, can you hear us? Can, can you hear us, Justice Westheiden? Um, may I then suggest, because we have, um, we, ha we have uh, Kiai, Mugambi Kiai, you have your hands raised. Do you want to come in until we manage to get uh, the good justice back? Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so just a, a few quick points. Um, most of them, of course, to reinforce what um, uh, Professor Miguel has said. Um, first, is, is a question of history, and, and, and histories will be contested. Let, let's be very clear about it, because whoever then um, owns, a hist owns history, perhaps owns a narrative. I think that's, that's very, very important. And the reason I, I am uh, reiterating the question of history, and I've raised it also with, with Prof, is that the Kenyan, the, this latest iteration of the Kenyan constitution, its history does not actually start in 1997, but in 1994, when a group of three civil society groups, the Lost Society of Kenya, 
Kenya Human Rights Commission and the Law Society of Kenya come up with what they call a model constitution. Now, this had been a response to the loss uh, of the opposition in the 1992 elections in Kenya to the dictatorship that was then uh, the, the ruling party after the introduction of multipartyism. And that led to a movement that then leads us to that phase that, that Prof refers to as uh, the official government uh, position. So I think, I think that, that's, that's very important. I also see a lot of similarities with Zambia, very uncanny similarities with Zambia, where when people lose power, uh, they, they seem to sober up and, um, and, and come uh, to their senses about the, the fact that um, being even-handed in the constitutional reform process is one of the most important aspects in terms of the principles of building a constitutional review process. That is something that um, I think as Zambian and Botswana go ahead, they need to keep their, their politicians or political elite alive too, that constitutions are not made for those in power, they're made for everyone. So that uh, you don't seek simple solutions or narrow, uh, narrow interest solutions, but you look at the bigger picture. I think those are two uh, points on to me. Th thank you very much. Very useful indeed. Um, I think it all goes back to the idea of a people-centered constitution that is fundamental to its legitimacy, uh, but also a, a, a process that should ideally include politicians uh, in a manner that uh, doesn't allow them uh, to disrupt it. I think maybe um, Mr. Justice uh, Van der Westheisen can tell us a little bit about how to combine uh, the, the two, how to make sure that yeah. it's people-centered but also enable uh, dialogue platforms for political elites to actually lead to a compromise agreeable framework. Thank you. Yes, thank you. First point, history. How important is it? It is extremely important. Um, when the constitution is drafted, you draft it based on the country's history. I think we must be distinguish what we mean when we ask history, uh, that we must record history. Do we mean the history of the country or the history of the constitution drafting process. Um, as far as the second is a more technical question, the constitutional court early on had to ask, answer the question whether one may refer to the records of the constitution drafting process to interpret something. And as far as I remember, they ruled that it can be done. But more importantly, the history of the country. South Africa emerged from the apartheid system and many, many things that are in the constitution were based on that particular um, experience. Uh, so not only to write, but later also to interpret. Now, my example that I mentioned earlier about a woman or a man, and what about somebody who does not wish to be categorized as a woman or a man? Um, clearly, if one looks at it, only on the wording, then one would be able now to say, no, the, the purpose is clear. The intention of the wording is to exclude people who do not want to be regarded as a woman or a man. However, if you say, and you don't have to refer to Van Avestaisen's memory on it, or what he wrote in his diary or in his life story, what you must simply look at is South Africa's history at the time. The, the big enemy was was apartheid, discrimination, the violation of people's dignity. So it is clear then that if you give it this purpose of interpretation, that woman or man would mean viewed in view of the history of the country, that it was to emphasize that women and men are equal also with regard to the very, very highest position. How to bring the politicians together to agree? <coughs> well. The simple answer in our case is there was no choice. Uh, we were at the end of the road with regard to the apartheid regime struggle to stay in power, um, the, the struggle against apartheid, international sanctions, etc. And as I said earlier, the country would have been in very bad shape if they did not agree. And therefore, deadlines were actually set. How to get them to agree? Um, you know, the chair of the of the Constitutional Assembly at the time was the present president, Cyril Ramaphosa. And one night uh, at about four o'clock in the morning, 
when things looked very grim and where deadlocks, several deadlocks were in the air and all the politicians or several politicians made very fiery speeches about their party and how they will never give in and so on. And um, Cyril Ramaphosa waited till the end and he said, we must go home now. We have four hours to think about this before we come back tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Think what will happen to our country if we cannot agree. Think what will happen to the value of our currency. Think what will happen to our international relations, etc. However, having said that, we must not be naive and think that power doesn't make a difference. But by the way, this whole choice of between, it's, it cannot, should not be a choice between whether politicians do it or the people, um, depending on your mechanism. But if the mechanism is that parliament in some form or with some kind of majority must adopt a new constitution, then obviously the politicians will have the final say. But as previous speakers said, one must be sensitive to the community. The community must have a chance to say what they want. Um, and, and technicians must help to write it in proper wording. So it, for me, it's not and or or for in the first place, the politicians are supposed to represent the, the people in any event, although they don't always do. As far as power is concerned, uh, from the South African example, when the interim constitution was drafted, at Kempton Park near Johannesburg. The ANC was still a revolutionary movement, not the government. It was clear that they will probably win the election, but the government was the government of the National Party of Mr. F.W. de Klerk. So, for example, ANC, African National Congress uh, representatives were strongly in favor of the rights of accused persons in criminal trials. They were strongly in favor of a strong human rights commission and ombudsperson, ombudsman, public protector. By the time we drafted the final constitution in Cape Town, <coughs> these dynamics have changed. Mr. Mandela was president, the ANC, they were the party in power. All of a sudden they were, and very understandably, they were much less enthusiastic, for example, about fair trial rights where there's a uh, where there's a, uh, you know vagueness and where there is doubt because it was their responsibility now to fight crime so previously criminals were almost seen as part of the anti-apartheid struggle but now the anc representatives would say we are responsible for law and order and safety and security and you cannot make rules that will let every second criminal get away on a technical point. And similarly, I already mentioned, they were much more cautious about the power of the public protector, the ombud, or, or the Human Rights Commission. Now, that, the last point on, on, on this issue about the, um, the, the politicians, of course, the trick is to get people to think not of the present incumbents and their own present position, but of 20 years in future and 50 years and 100 years. Uh, I sat as a judge in the Constitutional Court with a number of cases involving President Zuma, of course, as you can imagine, before that President Mbeki. And then the lawyers start arguing, but you must trust the president. And I said, I don't know whether I trust the president because I don't know who the president is going to be. The question is not whether I trust Mr. Zuma now. The question is whether I trust the president 50 years from now whom I, whom I, who might not even be born yet. Um, so the philosopher John Rawls called it a veil of ignorance. Uh, he said, if you draft the rules for, <laughs> for soccer, you must not know whether you are going to be the goalie or the striker. Because if you are going to be the striker, you will make the goal very big so that you can score lots of goals. And if you are the goalie, you're going to make it very small so that you can stop all the goals. So that is the ideal that we must make rules for a future situation without knowing who is going to be in the particular position. However, that is not so easy, as I said, because people know at that particular time they do have power. In our case, we knew, we knew that the ANC were going to be the governing party. 
Uh, however, even their own situation changed from that of a liberation movement to that of government. Um, it is all a question of necessity, you know. Uh, constitution drafting should not be a, an academic exercise for people who do not have anything better to do. Uh, it must be viewed for what it is, namely, Cyril Ramaphosa calls our constitution the birth certificate of the nation. Um, we must see it as something that if it's not there, and if it doesn't work, we will fail, we will be hungry, we will have war, we will die. It is as serious as that. Legitimacy, yes, there is a lot of criticism in South Africa and nowadays also against the courts. However, every political party from the far right to the far left, white, black, still refer to the constitution all the time in their arguments and still go to the courts. Uh, they might criticize the courts. Uh, the Zuma uh, st strategy is to say the courts are unfair and they're all against him and so on. But everybody still refers to the constitution at least. And then they will sometimes say, but the court is not interpreting the constitution correctly. But if one can get the constitution into that sort of central point as a touchstone, which every or a starting point for everybody, then I would say it does have legitimacy. Thank you. Uh Thank you very much. Overall, I think uh, this is a, it's a difficult process, making sure that the people not only feel that they are contributing, but they actually do contribute, but also at the same time, making sure that the political actors see value in going ahead, in compromising, in pushing the process forward ra ra rather than uh, un undermining it. A key point, and I think this is something that the conversation has to continue. And, and I think civil society also have to think about strategies to enable both. Uh, both processes. Um, there was uh, one, f a Pachza, I don't know if, if he or she is still there, uh, but it seems like the person has logged out now. Uh, but other than that, if the, if the person returns, maybe we can go back to them. But otherwise, yes. uh, it's over from my side. And thank, thank you very much again I'm to the panelists. Oh, go, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, apologies. Go ahead, please go ahead, uh, Pachza. Yes. Um... Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Much appreciated with all the comments. I am Paja Jimin Gandre. I'm an advocate of the High Court of, of South Africa, and I'm a, I'm a practitioner in Botswana as well. I'm a citizen of the Republic of Botswana. It is a very interesting uh, conversation we are having here. I thought I should make this input from the point of view of an insider who is at the same time an outsider, who is able to articulate issues from a, a, a comparative uh, approach. First of all, when we talk about my attitude to the constitution of Botswana is this. In Botswana, we do not need uh, uh, the reform of the constitution. We need an entire overhaul of the constitution. This is why I'm saying this. 1966, this constitution of Botswana was actually uh, 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 drafted uh, by our former colonial masters in England, just like the Zimbabwean constitution. Zimbabweans were, were brave enough to break away, to cut the umbilical cord from, 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 from the English constitution. Now, the first question would be, what is it that the people want their constitution to look and to feel like and to sound like? We can only get this once we engage the people. Once we engage the people, this is not a political grandstanding process, nor is it a judicial uh, grandstanding process. No, it's the people who have got to speak about what they feel and understand their constitution should be. Meaning my first suggestion is the first process in the constitutional overhaul, as I may call it, is to go to the people, a referendum, which takes into account the voice of the citizens of Botswana. And not only the citizens who are at home, the citizens who are also in the diaspora, including the permanent residents of Botswana and those who reside in the country. Now, once a referendum has been done and the report is collated, then we might want to engage in parliament 
about what Botswana are saying. And uh, 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 Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Adam Abebe, you, you call us the, the Botswanians. We are not Botswanians. The plural is Botswana. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, the problem with the constitution of Botswana, uh, the, 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 the judge said, but what is the rationale behind amending the constitution or uh, reforming it? And I will add my own uh, wedding overhauling it. It is because this constitution has passed its time. And this is why I say it has passed its time. Our constitution as it stands is a presidential constitution. Why do I say so? I say so because the constitution says the president may not be liable for civil or criminal prosecution. There is case law which has said where the Court of Appeal, which is the equivalent of the apex court, the constitutional court in South Africa, where the Court of Appeal has said the president is an embodiment of the state. Where have you ever heard that? That an individual becomes an embodiment of the state. It does not say yet at the same time. Here is a, a paradox and a, a, a fundamental anomaly. Whereas the constitution says uh, the president is not prosecutable and the case law says he's the embodiment of the state. That was the case of mutuality. Those who know may recall that fundamental case. The interpretation of our constitution by our courts and legal practitioners, including myself, is that our constitution is the supreme law of the country. However, the constitution does not expressly say so. It doesn't. So we benchmark from South Africa and we rely on the South African jurisprudence, which is underpinned by an express provision, the founding principles, as the, the judge was saying, that the constitution is supreme, that the separation of powers at the end. end. The constitution of Botswana does not say so. It does not say it is the supreme law. Now, in overhauling the constitution, this is what my fellow Batwana should be looking at. Is the constitution supreme or the president and his cabinet? These are fundamental issues that Batwana have got to confront and decide on. Batwana have got to decide on the founding values of their own constitution, underpinned by their culture, their tradition, and their ethos, as it happened in, in, in South Africa. The Constitution of Botswana does not expressly say there is a separation of powers between the legislature, the, 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 the executive, and the, the uh, uh, yes, you understand? it doesn't say so. But when you interpret the Constitution, you deduct that indeed the separation of powers because the Constitution established She's the presidency, the executive and uh, the judiciary. You understand? But there is a need to expressly allow the constitution to say so itself because that concretizes the supremacy of the constitution. And there's many other issues, uh, fundamental clauses that need express provision and definition on the constitution. Lastly, Botswana are at a dilemma. You see, there's this, what I call the Botswana exceptionalism, where we have been taught that Botswana is a, a, a one of the, the, the largest stars and donors of democracy on the continent. Uh, Jimmy. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm you, concluding. Can you conclude? Because now we are way yeah. past time. Okay, thank you, thank you. Less than five yeah. minutes. As I continue, no, no, not, but, not five but, minutes, just 30 seconds. I said less. I said less than five minutes. Thank you. Uh, you can't have less than five minutes, sir. Please. No, sir. Less than two minutes. Let's not waste more time then. Let me conclude. <laughs> and then, and then there, is a, there is a fundamental issue that the nation has got to confront. That is the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. The nation has got to take a decisive decision on whether we include uh, 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 socioeconomic rights, which are at present not included.
Yeah, th th thank you very much. I think he's raised a lot of points and I'm sure everybody's taking note. Um, but it was it was very wonderful again. I'm sure, as I said, our Botswana brothers and sisters are, are listening in and I hand it back to uh, Bokongo. Thank you very much. Point, just a quick one, quick question uh, from Honorable Yumi uh, Hili. Uh, to his, you can come in and just ask a few of your questions to the panel before the. Um, th thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sokwe. And thank you so much, uh, Bukongo, for having me. And um, thank you to all the panelists. I've been, though I came midway in the program, I think I've gathered quite a lot from this interaction. Um, what I wanted to ask, particularly uh, Judge uh, Johan van der Westeisen, was to speak a little bit more on the issue of, I don't know if we're going to be able to because uh, it seems we've run out of time, but what I was very interested in was the issue of separation of powers, because this is a very contentious issue. It brings a lot of uh, conflict, first of all, amongst the, the different uh, arms that are to be separated, as well as from both the spectators being your ordinary people and the spectators being the, or maybe spectators not the right way, being the participants where there might be uh, people in the legal fraternity, legislators, or the executive. So I'd, I'd, I had an interest in, in the judge speaking a little bit more to that. But um, what, I, what I wanted to say is that when it's all said and done, at the end of the day, the importance of the Constitution to all of us is its impact or its bearing on public policy. Because at the end of the day, the, the importance of laws to, to, to us as a people is how they impact our lives. So I, I, I wanted to hear a little bit more also on the impact of, uh, of, um, of constitutional review and or a, a look at a, at a forward looking. I wanted uh, us to speak a little bit more to the issues of the impact on public policy. But uh, one or two things that I also had, if I, if I may take advantage since I'm already on the podium, one or two of the things I, I also had while we're speaking here. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I say this because I'm a politician, but I often he hear this word political elites. I think it's a very weird word because of all activists, if you will, politicians, interact more with the people than anybody else. So if there's anybody who should not be classified as an elite, it will be the politician. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I think it's a, a bit of a disparaging uh, uh, phrase because, you know, uh, with all due respect to civil society, as a politician, I go out and I ask for a mandate from people. So to me, uh, and I'm not attacking anybody we are talking here. To me, civil society are the very people that I go out to consult. So when I speak to a group of people, activists or in a certain part of society and they refer to me as an elite, I'm often very shocked. I'm like, these elites are calling me an elite because I'm here elected by the people, having asked for a mandate from the people. And I have people who who are blended together, whether through profession or through a burning issue. But for all intents and purposes, they don't have the same mandate that I have. So I think, I think language is also very important when we speak to these issues. And, um, you know, I had a, a, a talking about a, a referendum. I think advocates should already know when you speak of a Bill of Rights, you cannot touch on a Bill of Rights without going through a referendum. It is a part of the Constitution, there are certain parts of the Constitution that you may tamper with in Parliament. But if you speak to a Bill of Rights, you cannot touch a Bill of Rights without going to the people. And fortunately, in our country, we have a very established consultative process. 
being mostly the Kotla system. I mean, with the passage of time and us being the new people of today, it might not be as effective as it used to be. But I would say it's still much more representative than any other system in other parts of the world that I have come across. So um, I, I, I have great trust in the outcomes that we will get from our own overhaul, review, uh, rebuilding, rewriting of our constitution, because I know it's going to go through a process that is going to involve, that is going to give a platform for every single Mozana to have a say. If they choose not to participate, it will be entirely up to them. But I know that that process will give a platform for every single Mozana to, to be able to say that piece. And ultimately, at, and, and one other thing is, we, we also have to understand where our roles are, who plays what role. At the end of the day, this is a lawmaking process. And by trying to make it sound like politicians will uh, hog the process, I think it's also a bit flawed because the role of legislators is to make laws. So if you're talking about a process of making laws, we must simply say legislators should fit in that place. There's a place, there's a place, there's, there's, there's a part of the, the process that legislators have to play and they must fit within that place. But I also agree, they must not think that because they make the law, they are the owners of the constitution. They are simply saying what our people have said, this is now how it has been filtered. This is, this, this is how it's been channeled now into a single document. So I think uh, all of us have a role to play civil society, the product of civil society being your everyday people, civil society in terms of the different advocacy groups. Um, and, um, the, 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 and of course, as, uh, as lawmakers, we have a role to play. So I think let's not push each other to a corner or to, to, to say, no, no, you don't, don't hog this. None of us should hog, us, should hog it. It belongs to the people of Botswana and all the different stakeholders are people of Botswana. So we should jointly do this for the future generation because uh, as we've been speaking, we're talking about a constitution that is about 56 years old now. So I think when we want to make a constitution now that will last another 56 times two years. So we must, we must, we must make this constitution for the future, not necessarily to, as much as people have been speaking to history, which is important, but the constitution should not be a thingy of necessarily dwelling on issues that are past, unless there are issues of injustice. I thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much. I, I think at this point, uh, uh, I don't know, say, because like we say, this is a process that we all will be involved in, and the judges and the other colleagues that are here. Uh, this is just the first step, which was a, more of a listening session. Uh, I, 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 we might not have enough time to give them an opportunity to answer your questions. But it's, I think our colleagues in the repertoire have captured those things and it's, a, it's questions that we want to ask or answer over time to ensure that. And, and you, by the way, uh, to the people of the uh, uh, Honorable Hili has been very close to the proceedings in, in, in Bokongo. So we, we, we are not uh, afraid of uh, letting him know and he knows he's confident that it is a discussion that is going to be part of uh, o o over time. So I, with that, in the interest of time, I think uh, I'm going to give to, I think it's uh, who's standing in for Steve. Uh, uh, Isabel, are you closing for Steve? Uh, yes, I am, thank you. <laughs> so uh, I won't be long. Um, just, I would like to thank all of our speakers um, for your time today. Uh, many of you have with been, uh, have been with us um, since quite early this morning. Um, we're quite appreciative of that. Thank you for your inputs. Um, I think this was indeed a productive discussion. I would also like to thank uh, our partners um, in this project, um, the Congo and International Idea, and also just to reiterate that um, Saya is really here in a supportive role. Um, and just to say that we are in support of what Botswana want 
um, out of this process. And then I would also just like to apologize for all the technical glitches earlier on. I'd like to thank all of our participants for your patience with us today. Um, you have truly made this a good and engaging event. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, having said that, uh, the, the question is what's next? Uh, as I said earlier, this is just was more of a listening. As you can see, we have not interacted with a lot of our speakers who are available to us over a longer period of time until hopefully the process is done. Now the question is what's next in the civil society space at least. What's next is having had these discussions, having had them, being bottled as we are without having had in time to talk, it's time for us to now go and go back to civil society in Botswana and say, how do we want this done? All of us. And it might include setting up uh, some sort of a group that does this, but which is basically however you want to set it up. As Bukong, we are going to call a meeting to say, ladies and gentlemen, you have had uh, the, 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 the government, you have had our international friends, you have had everyone. How best do we want to move this forward as a collective? It's not a Bokongo Secretariat or Bokongo Board issue. It has to be, so as, as we're talking inclusivity, it should be seen within us as Bokongo Secretariat, uh, providing that secretarial role to a civil society that is inclusive. And we have to sit down, that is what's next. And that is when we are going to sit back and reflect on the discussions that we have had today and say, how do we guide ourselves? And what, who do we need? What do we need? Our partners are International Idea, our partners, Saia, and many other partners, even locally here, the UN family and others, will be standing by us. We just need now to give them a plan of action. How do we want to move forward? How do we organize ourselves? And how do we want, because like, 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 like Mr. Hill is saying, Honorable Hill is saying, uh, you know, we are, going to, we are going into a process that not even our government has done. So we are all learning. So it's best that a civil society, having started where we are right now, we always be a step ahead to provide advice to the government. So I'm going to leave it as there, ladies and gentlemen, to say in the next meeting, we are going to discuss a way forward. We don't have a way forward. We will discuss it here, civil society, to say, this is a secretariat will facilitate only a meeting and you guys will decide how we move forward. We, we, we have had the story, you have had the discussions, to go and, and, and reflect on them and let's come back here to now decide a way forward, a plan of action. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. I want to take this opportunity to thank our partners, uh, to thank our audience, to thank our, our NGO partners and civil society partners who are here and everyone who has supported uh, this initiative uh, for the sake of Botswana, we thank you very much and have a good evening. Having said that, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Kiki to come and close with a word of prayer. Thank <laughs> you. Malina la mudi marara, mudi mu mora, le mudi mu maya wakalala lam. Rara ra kule boka for this wonderful day with wonderful dialogues. Ari tuti le kule kundi and we hope that this process here, the constitutional review, it's a must and it's a hatele lo open maybe le chaba buzana kotele. Rara tama ala baba tama yansa ala baba salang. This is the review of the review and all mo kule mo kumelo nyarna ibo njeso Christ. Amen. Yeah, and thank you, colleagues, uh, for our international uh, partners in Botswana. We start a meeting with a prayer, and we end it with a prayer. It's our cultural right. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much, everyone, and we look forward to engaging. <laughs> Um, again, I, I heard you a second ago.
Okay, 